Speaking podcast. This is Chris Shelton, your host. Thank you very much for inviting me into your home again this week. And this week is an interview I have been looking forward to for actually a very long time. Um, I my guest today is a man named Mitch Brisker, who you're going to learn about. He was a Scientologist, not a Sea Org member. He was a professional Scientologist, film director, film creator, and he worked. At Golden Era Productions, right, with getting directions and orders from David Miscavige directly for years, working on Scientology's technical training films and other similar properties and audiovisual properties, you know, Golden Era Productions and now Scientology Media Productions in Los Angeles are really state-of-the-art facilities that they have invested millions and millions of dollars in, in terms of equipment and uh, training and, you know, and all that. And they use those facilities to produce audiovisual properties for the Church of Scientology for its use in training Scientologists and how to do Scientology. That's what those films are about. And in making audiovisual properties that promote or market Scientology. And that's the other uh, aspect of what goes on at Gold and at Scientology Media Productions. It's a big topic. There's a lot of stuff there. There, everything from uh, you know the day-to-day grind of doing that work to the policies and issues that L. Ron Hubbard wrote specifically for the what's called the cine division in Scientology, the cinematic, the area where they're making all this stuff. Um, and there's a lot of lore, and there's a lot of stories, and we've heard from Mark Headley over the years, because he used to work up at Gold, lots of interesting and sometimes funny stories about what life is like there. We've heard from Jefferson Hawkins about life and marketing at Gold, and now today we're going to hear from Mitch, who has recently, just in the last few years, escaped from Scientology after years of working up there, and he's got a story to tell. So, Mitch, welcome to my show. Uh, thanks, Chris. It's really great to be here. This is cool. I, uh, I'm really privileged to speak with you today. Well, I, I feel the same. So uh, thank you very much for agreeing to do this. Yeah, no problem. I mean, let me just say, in terms of escaping, I mean, I was never. I, it, it, we're talking more about the 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 mental binding yes. that trap a person because, you know, uh, in my position, I was free to come and go. As a, you know, the I worked with all the people you mentioned. I worked with all of them, and you yeah. know, unlike them. I lived in LA. I spent five days a week, mostly, generally speaking, five days a week at the base, and I would drive home. At the time, I was married and I had kids. I had I still have kids, but I'm not married. But mm-hmm. so, yeah. And in terms of escaping, I'm still escaping. I mean, talking with you today is part of my escape because I realized there is, you know, I was reluctant to do this uh, for a bunch of sort of reasons that you could understand mm-hmm. well, mm-hmm. having to do with. Uh, uh, brainwashing and coercive control. Um, but I was also reluctant to do it because there's people at that base and, and at SMP and, and people in the Sea Org and Scientologists that I really, truly care about, some who came to my assistance in times when I was having personal difficulties. Then I realized after a time that it, m- my reluctance to speak about my experience was misplaced mm-hmm. because if I really cared about those people, I would try to help pave the way to them leaving as well. So I guess that raises my SP potential. <laughs> yes, okay. clearly. Clearly. It's, uh, it's, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it, yeah. Yeah, trying it, to help people a, is definitely uh, suppressive. Yeah. So yeah. but because uh, because I really do wish these people the best. And, of course. And it's amazing once you do step outside whatever configuration of reality presents itself that allows you to step outside and get a glimpse outside, boy, the stuff you start to see, it's mind blowing. You know that. I know you've talked about it. I've heard you talk about it. Yeah. But, uh, so I'm, I'm just ratifying your earlier statements, but so go ahead. So let's go ahead and just kind of do an overview first in terms of, um, you know, when did you first get involved in Scientology? How did it happen? What interested you about it? Let's go ahead and start with that. Yeah. Okay. Fine. So you want to talk about what, what the origin, my origin yes. story, my Scientology origin story. <laughs> that's right. Uh, yeah. It, it, that's an unavoidable. Uh, you know, when you're in Scientology, uh, socially, uh, Scientologists, when they get to know each other, they always want to know how'd you get in. 
So it's a thing. And everybody on YouTube is like, I was born in, I was dragged in, I was, everybody has an origin story. It's, it's, it's impossible to not talk about. Mine's kind of gory. And I was reluctant to talk about it because mm -hmm. it basically started when I woke up, I was 23. I just turned 23. I was a dropout from film school from a, a really good school, difficult uh, California Institute of the Arts, where I was mm. enrolled as a, was, uh, as a film student. I woke up and my girlfriend of a few years uh, who I was living with had uh, uh, tragically died of an overdose of heroin mm -hmm. uh, and was dead on the kitchen floor. And we had been, she and I had been involved in a film, not because we were, uh, you know, not because I was a film student or an actor or any of those things, all of which I had done, but because I had experience on drugs and I was for a time, I w there was a period of time when I wasn't doing drugs and, and uh, it's a long story, but I ended up uh, working on a film called Dusty and Sweets McGee, which is still streaming on Amazon. Uh, it's in the Museum of Modern Art uh, collection, permanent collection. It was the top grossing film for two weeks in July of 72. It's, it's a quote unquote quasi documentary, but there's nothing documentary about it. And my girlfriend and I had played the title characters in this sort of drug-soaked, you know, quasi, like fake cinema verite, you know, story about junkies in L.A. It's an interesting film. And the guy who directed it, Floyd Mutrix, had just gotten into Scientology through an actress who was a girlfriend of his. And we were close, uh, the three of us, my, my late girlfriend and Floyd and whatever. And he had just gotten involved in Celebrity Center, which back in those days, was being run by Yvonne Gillum Gench, mm -hmm. who I got to know very well. And it was, it's, it, and he brought me down there. Uh, so that's how I got in. So, okay. I, I mean, uh, and it's a, it, there's way more to that story. It wasn't an easy entry. What they were doing in taking a kid with a drug problem. I mean, look, Chris, I ended up living with the staff for six weeks. Wow. This is not this is not something that's done like this, like I was in SeaWorld birthing, but it was kind of a magical hippie. It was like it was like a hippie commune without the sex and drugs. Well, without the drugs, I don't know about the sex. <laughs> right. But, um, you know, and, and it was in an era when you had uh, a lot of consciousness raising communities were starting mm. to sprout up. Uh, you know, us boomers, we thought we were going to change the world. Mm -hmm. You know, we grew up under the threat of nuclear war. And when we were little kids, when we were kids, Kennedy was killed. And, you know, and then when we were teenagers, RFK was killed and, and Martin Luther King and there was a Vietnam War. Things were fucked up. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, it, we were like, Nobody in my generation wanted to live past 35. We were like, what's the point? Because, excuse me, because you morph into something, you know, you become the man, you join the establishment. We were never going to do that. And so to me, Scientology looked like counterculture. Mm. It looked like a community of people that positively wanted to change the world. I, I don't know if you're aware of it. And maybe this is too far afield, uh, for this interview, you can stop me if I'm- Yeah, yeah, go ahead, on. what you got? So uh, far, I'm fascinated by what you're saying because you're speaking to the culture and time, you know, and the flavor of that time period and right. how Scientology presented right. itself, which was different than it is now. And it speaks like, to very the fact different. that it Oh yeah, does, very different. I mean, you know, we haven't we haven't mentioned it, but I wrote a book. Um, yes. I'm, uh, it's almost done. I haven't completed it and it, it'll be done soon. And the first three chapters of that book are about that time and that era. And I was in a unique position. I mean, you'll have to read it in order to, because we could go into it some other time, but I don't want to just make this about me. But I grew up in a very interesting family, politically, uh, uh, culturally, uh, in terms of my connections, my family's political connections. And, you know, they had good friends who were, you know, went underground, they were communists that, you know, we used to have the FBI uh, taking license plates at our door when I was, I mean, at our, wow. you know, on our street. I mean, when I was like a little kid. So wow. my parents had friends who were blacklisted. Wow. You know, they were friends with, oh, what is his name, who wrote Lawrence of Arabia, Michael, Michael, who was blacklisted. Um, I, I need another take on that because it's just a crime. I can't remember his name. No worries. But anyway, so it was just a really different era. And we were a generation 
that was going to shift the world into a more positive direction. Right. Of course, you know, I think every generation perhaps is, but, you know, we were experimenting with psychedelics. And, you know, when I was a teenager, I was reading Hindu scriptures and I got I got introduced to Alan, um, you know, uh, I, we should have done this on a day when my brain wasn't asleep. <laughs> you know, the philosopher, the British philosopher, Alan, Alan Watts. Uh, yeah, Alan Watts. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. The British philosopher, I'll yeah. do that so you can cut it out. And <laughs> and so, you know, when I was a teenager, I was listening to Alan Watts lectures on the radio, you know, late at night, some station would. Uh, so we were like doing all this stuff. And then I, I also inadvertently got in it, it involved in drugs. I grew up in Laurel Canyon, which is this infamous neighborhood. It was where the Southern California music scene uh, began. I mean, when we were teenagers, like we used to listen to the birds rehearsing on Cass Elliott's back deck in the canyon. I could hear it from my parents' house. Wow! So it was just that kind of a scene, right? right. And, you know, I spent a lot of time on the Sunset Strip sneaking into clubs, you know, seeing the Doors who were the house band at the Whiskey or the Beach Boys who were the house band at another club down the street. Wow. I mean, these were really, these were formative times, but it was just happening a, a mile from my, where I grew up, where I lived. So, you know, it was just part of my life. And so were drugs. And because the Vietnam War opened a sort of a Pandora's box in terms of how heroin got into America, it permeated the middle class and upper class white neighborhoods like it had never done. Right. So I got kind of swept up in that thing. And, you know, it was not, you know, uh, it's a whole other story. I almost got arrested smuggling a little bit of pot uh, wow. at LAX when I was 16 years old. But it, wow. I, it was just, I was with my parents, so they, they couldn't do anything. But well, I mean, what? I, what was it about, you know, kind of getting back to the Scientology yeah, please. The train here, right? Because I, I am, because it sounds absolutely fascinating. I'm sure you've well, got a ton I, yeah, of stories. Just, yeah, yeah, and you can read about it. So yeah, absolutely. There'll be a book and you can read all about it. And it's, <laughs> it's, right. it's, We're you know, definitely you, going to plug that book when you publish that thing. Uh, absolutely, yeah. right? Yeah. But what was it about? You know, so I've I definitely got the picture of the culture and the times and 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 your position in it growing up in California in the '60s. I mean, you know, yeah, wild times for sure. Yeah, what I mean, not just it, California, but Laurel Canyon. Yeah, but what was it about Scientology that you thought, oh, this has something. This is something interesting. This is something I should be part well, of. Well, I can tell you in a nutshell. Yeah, I mean, that's yeah, uh, because I was so desperate and so broken and so traumatized by what I had just recently been through mm -hmm. that I pretty much would have eaten anything out of anybody's hand if it mm -hmm. looked like it was something that could sucre me back. And I mean, I was in really bad shape. I mean, mm -hmm. in that sense, you know, I was a prime candidate for being sucked into a cult, but it, that's not how it appeared. I mean, I'm, I'm making this more complicated than it should be. So I, I go to, Floyd Mutrix arranges mm -hmm. for me to go into CC. Like, that's a big deal because he's a noted film director and he's made a couple of notable films. <clears throat> the film that I was in was notable at its time and is critically really well thought of. Uh, and he, anyway, he did some other things. But so he was a slab, right? Mm -hmm. So he brought me in there. So that I had cachet from that, right? Uh, I was a you know dropped out film student with a drug problem. Like, this is perfect. Perfect cease. And so essentially I had an interview with uh, an ethics officer, an MAA, who mm -hmm. you've spoken about the, the post. Uh, I had an interview with an MAA who later told me she was literally squeezing her chair to keep her shit together while she was listening to the story. Wow. She was like my age and I'm sitting in front of her and going, oh, I'm all strung out in heroin and my girlfriend's dead and I and I don't know what to do. And they, they're not, they don't, that's not a thing that they deal with, right? Right. And, you know, there was no, Narconon was like nothing back then. Oh, yeah. Narconon uh, was four years old in 1973, and it was mostly a prison program. Yeah. And it was, yeah. I mean, the, so then they, so then she took me to the MLO, mm -hmm. routed me, because, you, you know, you and I know, Chris, that any, everything that needs to move from one point to another point, whether it's a human 
animal or just a physical thing, it gets routed, right? Yep. So yep. Yep. They're all the same. So then I was routed to the MLO, which is the medical liaison officer, which if your viewers don't know, the uh, the CR members access to healthcare is very restricted. Everything has to go through this office of the medical liaison officer. So because I essentially had a medical problem, they, uh, they took me, I saw her and she was a lovely person who had been a nurse uh, and was very caring. And she listened to me and basically said, look, here's the deal. If you want to get off of drugs, if you apply yourself and you use what we have here, you can get yourself off drugs. We can't do that for you. Mm. But if you do this, we can get you off drugs. And then you can just go. You do not have to become a Scientologist. Mm. And I kid you not, she mm. made me that promise. Like, wow. Like today, if you said that to a person coming in to solve a problem, Oh, yeah. No, that wouldn't fly you, at all. Yeah, It would not fly. You would no. be in so much trouble for a bunch of reasons. For one thing, you're giving the person a hidden standard. Mm -hmm. You're saying, you know, if Scientology works, then you want to go, you know, but if it doesn't work, you. but she literally made this promise to me. Uh, and so I took her up on the promise. That's the whole reason. That's what attracted all me right. to it. There we go. So you're hooked up with Celebrity Center, and we, we've we talked on the show at various times about Celebrity Center and about Yvonne Gench, the person who ran right. Celebrity Center. They were actually the person who's actually responsible for creating it in the first place. Absolutely. Right, it, it would was not her. exist without her. Exactly. And then she went and actually, you know, modeled how it should look and act and how it should be, and it was a very non Sea Org, non Scientology kind of environment for for yeah. comparatively because yeah. she was so yeah. progressive, so art centric, so validative of artists and and celebrity right. VIP types, and she just wanted to keep bringing people in. And I've heard that it was you know there were poetry readings and there were people coming in and just doing art in the building, and it was just this very community type of thing, totally yeah. different from how Scientology mm -hmm. is now. Yeah. Um, so that's the scene you walk into, and I just kind of wanted right. to help, you know, set that stage a little bit. So how does that go from you being a failed film, you know, artist and somebody who's strung out on drugs to what's the, what's the middle story to getting you cleaned up and, and well, what happened? <laughs> right. Um, yeah, you know, uh, it's kind of a cliche when people say that it's uh, true that we all live more than one life. Mm -hmm. So... Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're asking me about well what your next life yeah i've mm -hmm. unfortunately have had lived more lives than i care to but uh but whatever so how what was the story so uh okay so there i am i'm living with the sea org members i was there from what i remember about six weeks um and i don't think you read that part of my book mm. i covered that not yet but but you'll appreciate this um, I couldn't sleep because, you know, when you're going through, when you're getting off of a drug like heroin, which by the way, is not that hard to get off of. Uh, mm. it's, it's, it's all the other stuff that people take like fentanyl and all that crazy mm. stuff. And it's really tough. I mean, people have been getting off of opiates for real organic. I mean, I wasn't doing synthetic stuff. It takes three days. It's like having a horrible case of the flu. And then you're left with what caused you to do it to begin with. And that's really the struggle. The struggle is not to get off drugs. It's to then finally confront the reasons why you took them to begin with. So, oh, I would definitely agree with that. I think that's a very, very profoundly true statement. Yeah, it's it's it, very true. So, yeah. Uh, and, you know, I learned, believe it or not, and jumping forward a little bit, you know, I did a lot of work for Narconon. I was responsible for helping to develop the Narcanon Pro as it exists today. Oh, wow. And, and um, yeah, I co-wrote 26 or 28 films. Um, I basically kind of oversaw the entire program, me and a couple of other people, and uh, me and another guy back in 2016, I think. We presented it at ABLE to all of the Narcanon EDs from around the world in a three-day conference, which was myself and, other, and two other people, uh, another pro, and a guy from CMO. Uh, hmm. So yeah, I'm real familiar with it. And then I wrote their current 
uh, marketing campaign. I mean, you have to understand, I had this debt. I always felt I had a debt to Scientology for getting um, me off the drugs. Okay. And the, yeah, you, you just got to understand. So I was paying my debt. That was the work I did on Mark on That was my debt. But the reason I brought that up is because I did a lot of research into addiction when I was doing the marketing campaign. And the thing that I came to realize was that I discovered uh, through somebody, I can send you a link, whatever, to his uh, his work, but there's a, a journalist whose brother was an addict, blah, 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 British guy. And he had discovered uh, that the real, uh, the opposite of addiction is not sobriety, it's connection. And so what people become addicted mm -hmm. to things, uh, whether they're drugs or sex or candy bars, whatever, something that you could do compulsively that's ruining your life, that's an addiction. It doesn't matter what it is. Right. They become addicted because they become disconnected. And and we know this because soldiers coming back from Vietnam who were addicted, huge numbers of them stopped being addicted when they became reconnected with their families. Mm. The, the addictions just fell away. So the, the reason, so I did a whole marketing campaign for them based on this idea that Narcan will reconnect you with all of the things that you've lost, including yourself. And it, it actually can be true. It has worked for people. I know mm -hmm. people who successfully gone through the program, but it's not because any of the technology is doing that. It's because you have a group and if they're, if they're caring uh, and attentive, which they are not always, then they will cause your addiction to become disrupted in such a way that it will give you a window with which you can reconnect with right. the things that cause you to be addicted to begin with. And, you know, I did this marketing campaign for Narcan and I was like, wow, it's not Narca, it's not the technology. <laughs> It's, it's the disruptive factor. They're disrupting the drug cycle. And then the person, because they want to get off of it, they get off of it, and then they take credit for it. Because, yeah. And I real, I realized this looking back, that it was those six weeks that I spent getting off of drugs, uh, you know, uh, living with the staff. I took on all of their cleaning stations. You'll appreciate that as an FCR mm. member because I couldn't sleep. So everybody was like, I was like, clean away. You know, you yeah. And, and I was happy to do it. And they were super happy. I polished the floors. I worked in the nursery. I cleaned dishes and I, I was happy to do it. I was not being forced to do it. I was just happy to have another person to talk to and, right. and something to do so I could focus on getting my body, you know, rid of these drugs. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you, I think what you're saying right now is really important. I want to, I want to underline it a little bit because I've dealt okay. with addiction in my family. I've dealt with addiction mm -hmm. in my life beyond working with Scientologists who were right. uh, drug addicts right. in the past or present. Right. Um, and it is the most ragingly upsetting and difficult and um, just, you know, carpet chewing, like you're just so upset with, you yeah. know, this person and and struggling so hard um, with, you know, rehab and then coming out and going back on and rehab and coming out and going back on. And it's exactly what you're saying about these connections, because, of course, what happens with so many addicts, I won't say most because I don't know, but I certainly know what this happens a lot, is they will go out to a rehab where they do disconnect and break up their life and are isolated, get off the substance, get the substance problems, ish, you know, kind of dealt with. But then they tend to go right back to all the social connections they had before, yeah, which were encouraging yeah. them to do the drugs, providing the drugs, and creating or at least not solving the exact same problems and lack of you know emotional fulfillment that was causing the person to go to the drugs in the first place. So yeah, and that's yeah, the exactly. that's the part where I think a lot of rehab falls down is the what is your life going to be after the rehab is done. And how and what do we need to do to change that up or fix that so that you are not put back in that same messy, awful place where you're going to go right yeah. back to the drugs, you know? Yeah, so exactly. That's, you're exactly right. And, and even, yeah, you shouldn't even qualify that by saying you don't know because you only have limited experience. But I have really broad experience with this and you're 100% correct. Awesome. You just, you need new, you need to reconnect with things that are important. Yeah. yeah. So, in terms of my story, yeah. to get back to to get back to that, um, so I spent those six weeks with them, uh, uh, and 
There was no Purif, by the way. Right, because so, this was yeah, early 70s. So, that's right. Yeah, no Purif. That wasn't until uh, 79, I think, 78 or yeah, 79. I, yeah. I think so. Yeah, the sweat yeah, out program so. at first, and then it became the yeah. Purif. Yeah, yeah, I know one of those guys who was in the. Yeah, in the <laughs> my parents did that old that first one. You no, know. no, but the first the two pilot guys that people talk about it. Oh, the, you knew the those guys. Yeah, I knew one of them. I oh, was yeah. talking to him one day, and he told me about he was one of the guinea pigs that they put in that sweatsuit and like, right. marched him around. It was crazy, but anyway. Uh, so during those six weeks, I lived with the staff, and then every morning, I would go to I would walk a few blocks to Celebrity Center. Uh, you know, the hippie commune uh, that it was back then. And I was on course. I did, you know, I did a comm course, uh, a communications course, mm -hmm, which I think you've mm -hmm. spoken about. And I was this, did... the, this was the 1970s version where was, was it, you're sitting there for hours or was it a pretty light? Yeah. Uh, it, no, it was not what we call the success through communication course. Yeah. That's the redo, which is the sort of the lighter they, grade version of what they yeah, were they doing. call it. They're called permissive TRs. You right. Remember that? That's right. Yeah, I mean, I did, I did the film, uh, the different tier courses and their criticisms. Right. I, yes. Yes. I that one. Yeah. So I think, yeah, I did it at least once. I might. Yeah, I think I only did it once. So yeah, I had to do deep, deep dive, deep study into all of that stuff. But uh, it was no, they, it was quasi. No, it was not hard, 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 hard TRs. Okay. But it was hard TRs. It was yeah. hard enough that it was tough to get through. But I can tell you, it wasn't a bad thing, as I remember. Mm -hmm. And then I did an HQS course, right? The mm -hmm. Hubbard Qualified Scientologist course, which was a pretty beefy course back then. I think it's even more beefy now. Would and you agree with me that following your drug detox and work that you were doing and connection work that you were doing, that the TRs course might have helped instill some degree of discipline and con and sort of as they put it in Scientology, it's a great word, so I'll use it, sort of confronting the reality yeah. around you. Yeah. Well, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. It's like, yeah, you've just bullseyed in on something mm. that's extremely important. Um, that same person, the medical officer who said, if you do this, right, them and then also, of course, the revisor, they said, look, because I would complain I would complain. I sit there and I do tears and the the kind of, uh, I, I mean, imagine I, the best way I could explain withdrawing from heroin is a really bad flu, right? Without the fever, right? Mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. muscle cramps, sweating, nausea. It's a really bad flu and mm -hmm. it's torturous because you know there's a switch you can hit and it'll turn the flu off. Right. You don't have that when you have the flu. You're like, I'm going to be miserable for three days. Just but if there, if you knew there was a magic switch that would turn that flu off, you, you, you'd go for it. Oh yeah. So, and oh, it also yeah. turns off like the mental emotional thing. It's like uh, that's right. Yeah. So, but so anyway, what they told me, and I, this is like to your point, was because I would complain that it would amplify the pain. Mm -hmm. That doing TRs, sitting in a chair, would amplify the pain, mm -hmm. especially doing you know confronting with your eyes closed, confronting with your eyes open. Mm -hmm. Those two first two TRs that you encounter. And it would amplify it and it would get worse. And they would say this classic, you know, thought stopping cliche, which is out of uh, some old Greek philosophy or something, this idea that the way out is the way through. That's right. right. What turns it on, will turn so, it off. <laughs> yeah. So they're like, well, yep. But inadvertently, it gave me something to do. Like, mm -hmm. Chris, I needed something to do with mm -hmm. my, my, my what do you dysregulated emotions right mm -hmm. i needed something to do so if mm -hmm. i could tell myself it's the if i if so i became convinced that the more it hurt the less time it would hurt for mm. so i was able to convince myself of that and so i was like bring it on right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it, and it's a form of hypnosis i mean let's mm -hmm. be honest about this this is not i'm i don't want to promote to somebody who's going through what i went through or some version of it i don't want to promote that you know you should check this out there's a way to do it that's right well i want but, to be clear i want to be clear that that's exactly why i've been describing this in sort of a roundabout way is because it's not 
it, it's not that these TRs are the thing you need to, to deal no. with your withdrawal. It's that it ha- just so happens that some of the actions and the discipline of doing a thing with a purpose and a, and a, and a, you know, and a drive to do it and forcing yourself to do it despite the discomfort. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly. the cathartic part. Yeah, it, that's you exactly know? right. And and that is that is um, an authentic human experience entirely and completely independent of Scientology. That's right. That's that right. they they uh, exploit and then kind of possess as their sort of magic special sauce, right? Exactly. So Exactly. I try uh, to highlight those points when they come up because it's important for people to understand that that the gains that people have in Scientology, they always attribute to L. Ron Hubbard in Scientology, even though the actual source of that gain was probably something completely disrelated, which you absolutely could have gotten some other way without all the authoritarian crap that Scientology brings into it. Yeah. You know, and yeah. that's why or, we kind of or, bend over backwards a little bit here explaining this. Yeah, it's, it is difficult, but I think there's a lot of self-hypnosis. Uh, I, not I agree. self, but Agreed. there's a lot of hypnosis. I mean, it's... Yeah. Uh, so then, let me see, I did the, the communications course, then I did the HGS course, where I was also introduced to doing um, objectives, which is a great way to engage in a community, because they're like games mm-hmm. that you're playing, right? And, mm-hmm. and it, 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 people weren't doing it, like on HQS, they weren't doing it for the hundreds of hours they do on the survival rundown. Right. Right? So it was a little different, but... Um, so then I did that, and then I did the. You'll appreciate this. I actually I did the HSDC course, the Hubbard Standard Dianetics. Ah, course. yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so you were learning how to run Dianetics. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so uh, Dianetics became my life. I mean, geez, I I like. Wow. You know, I mean, I did. I I co-wrote and directed every infomer. I did the Dianetics how-to video. Oh uh, right, it, right. Chris, you could if you just showed up at my house at four a.m. Uh, and woke me out of bed and said, I need a book one session. I could just give it to you. It yep. just, I will never get that stuff out of my head. You know, the little card that comes with the kit, you know, when yeah. people edit, there's a, it's called a command card. Yeah. Okay. So when I was directing actors to process each other with Dianetics, uh, actually, we're not supposed to say that Dianetics is not a process, by the way. Oh, Really? Oh, no. Yeah, technically, you're not allowed. I When I was writing and stuff, I'd get little corrections like, Dianetics is not a process, it's a procedure. Scientology is a process, Dianetics is a procedure. So these wow. things, it's, it's very important that you never mix the two. You've heard this. Yeah, yeah. But when, you, when you're when you making films and TV ads, it's very important. And, you know, when you see Ms. Gavage speaking at a... At a, at a an ideal org opening and or you see the stage and you see the dianetic symbol on the left and the Scientology. I think it's dianetic symbols on the left, Scientology symbols on the right, uh, on the stage design. Mm-hmm, I, I mm-hmm. think whatever it's on, that's mandated. Oh, like yeah. They, every little bit. Every little yeah, bit. Like, wh- oh, yeah. Which side they're on, they're like totally mandated. Yeah. So anyway, getting back to the card, because that's the anecdote. So I, the actors could never remember the commands, right? They, they would always flub them or have problems with them. You know, go to the beginning of the incident. Tell me when they are. Right. Like, Return it, to the know. beginning of the incident and tell yeah. me when you're there. <laughs> yeah. Move to the end of the incident. And tell, yeah. tell me what you see. You yeah. Know? Yeah. All that stuff. And and they and they. It's not that they're difficult lines, but there's something about the roteness. You know, they're tough. So then I would give them the book to hold in their lap, right? Kind of just up a little for camera, and then I would put the commands on a piece of paper, so they would have a cheat sheet, right? They yeah. could look down at. Because you couldn't use the book. Theoretically, I mean, Hubbard said you use the book. But the, he, the way the book's laid out, the commands are spread across yeah, multiple Yeah, they're pages. all over the place. There's no, yeah, there, a, there's no like, one, two, three, yeah. four, here's the process or the procedure. Yeah, nowhere. So It's nowhere in I that book. A, yeah, so I had it all written out yeah. on like a cheat sheet. And I put it in the book so they could look down at it like they were looking at the book. And then it was like, you know, oh, we well, should just print it up and put it in the, and put it in the kit. So anyway, that's how that came about. Oh, that's funny. Um, oh, that's funny. That's, yeah, it was the cheat sheet. So, and we spent a lot of time like how we're going to design it, you know, so that it worked. And, right. And uh, they, they, you know, you're allowed to look down at it when you're audit- when you're running the procedure. Uh-huh. <laughs> so it, it it solved a huge problem for me because I had a way of uh, feeding their their lines. 
but anyway, let's get back to your original question. Yeah. So six weeks, six weeks later. Yep. Um, yeah, I understand. When I walked in there, I was 23 years old. I was six foot tall. I weighed 27 pounds, right? My, yeah, 127 pounds. What am I saying? I weighed 127 pounds. Wow. Which I was really skinny. I mean, I, I was on, I was on the, the, what's her name? Amy, uh, my brain's not working today. The singer, Amy, the one who died of heroin, unfortunately. Oh, oh, uh, Winehouse. Yeah, I was on the Amy Winehouse diet. Right, okay, so, right. Which is, uh, boy, if you want to lose weight, heroin's the way to go. And six weeks later, I was a healthy 165. I was sleeping eight hours a night. And I was just a really happy camper. Wow. I mean, I didn't I didn't have anything. I, I could go back to college. Uh I had that. I had my, you know, my parent, whatever. I didn't own anything, right? But you know, and my girlfriend was dead, but I was really in good shape. So I talked to the MLO to make a long story shorter, hopefully. Um, and she said, Okay, good, great, you're off drugs. You can go. Like she like there was she was like <laughs> Wow. I, yeah. I mean, it was just so different back then. I'm telling you, this is the Scientology yeah. my parents got involved yeah. in. It was, yeah. it really was kind of different. And I'm talking about yeah. it at, the, at your level, obviously at the Sea yeah. Org where Hubbard was, it was batshit crazy. But at yeah. the lower levels, people really were using this stuff in an honest effort to try to help. Yeah, well, you people know? are, you know, I wrote in my book somewhere that, you know, same way that dogs reflect their owners, right? Mm. People in a group like like Scientology, like the Sea Org, they will reflect their leader. Yeah, sure. Right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, Miss Gavage, I guess me, I heard the dogs were belonged to Shelly, but he had these five beagles that I mean, I was attacked numerous times for doing nothing, but I mean he had the meanest dogs in the world. Really? <laughs> his, oh, little, yeah. his little beagles are mean? Uh his were. I didn't I have know a that. I have, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, well, any dog can be mean. You just have to be. No, that makes sense, actually. That makes yeah. complete sense, of course. Yeah, and so at Celebrity Center, you had Yvonne. So, right. So she was, people were in her sphere. They were in her bubble. Right. I mean, it, she was amazing. I, there's a story in my book where uh, I was at CC for maybe a week. I was really in pain, and I hadn't slept. I called a doctor I knew. This is crazy, Chris. I called a doctor that I knew, and I said, I need sleeping pills. And he said, well, what are you doing? Because he knew I, he knew I was struck out. This doctor was trying to help me. And uh, I said, well, I I'm, I'm in, I joined, I joined, I don't know what word I said, but I said, I'm, I'm in Scientology. And he said, you know, that's good. I think they'll help you. Uh, so he's like, yeah, sure, I'll write you a script. So he wrote me a script for sleeping pills. I talk my course supervisor into loaning me his car. And I drive like two miles to the pharmacy. I pick up the script. I, I go back to the staff house. I, I drop one. I take a sleeping pill and I sleep like a baby. The next night when I'm walking home from course, uh, I decide, well, I'll just take one now. And I'm in a coffee shop and I just pass out into a plate of food. Oh my God. <laughs> it's just like, oh I'm my like, God. I'm just like gone. Right. And there were two students, uh, there were two students in, in the coffee shop who recognized me because everybody knew me. I was a project. I was this, you know, film school dropout, drug addict that was brought in by Floyd Butrix. And so every I was like a pet project of celebrity. Right. So everybody knew mm -hmm. me. And so these two students, I, I don't know who they are, uh, they saw me and they picked me up and they literally carried me like a block to the staff house. And when I got there, there was a, a little bit of a of, of a kerfluffle kind of thing, like a little bit of a, and then Yvonne. It was after hours, and Yvonne came down from down the stairs from the second floor where the bedrooms were. She came down in a in, a, in like a bathrobe and like she'd been asleep, I guess. She came down and she looked at me and she put her arm around me, and she said, "Let's get you to bed, dearie." And this. Petite woman, I mean, yeah, I was 127 pounds, but still, she weightlessly guided me up to the bedroom. And I, and guess what happened the next day? Hmm. Nothing. A guy came to me who I'm going to remain nameless, but I mean, he'll be, I'm not going to say his name, but he ended up, he was in this here, he ended up leaving and becoming a TV and film actor. And he's probably got 50 credits to his name. And uh, 
He's a very well-known guy, but and he and I were in the same room when we became friends. He came to me and he said, look, you got to give me the drugs. They'd asked him, you know, go see Mitch, tell him to turn over the drugs. He came to me. He said, give me the drugs. I'm like, oh, okay. And that was it. Nobody ever mentioned it. Right. Now, this was such a different Scientology. They were like, yeah, very different. didn't mention it. They didn't mention it. They went, okay, you're going to be late for court. Give me the drugs. You're going to be late for court. Go. Because it was just like, keep this guy. Like today, if that happened, I would have been dragged in front of the entire crew. I would have been ridiculed. Oh, yeah. I would have been handed a toothbrush to scrub the toilets. I would have, you know, it just would be horrible. Um, but back then it wasn't. So and I, I, I guess I should. I'm I'm glad I remember to say this because you asked what appealed to me about it. Yeah. That promise that the medical officer made at the beginning about do this and we'll help you and you can stay or not. And then that incident with Yvonne and then the way they reacted to right. because it was just part of my struggle. My going and getting drugs, it was like it was just part of what I was going through. And they knew that and they responded to it. And um, I stayed and, you know, and, and, and it turned I out mean, quite and, different. Yeah. I, I mean, in that context, in that time, that's, that looked like the sensible decision to make. Yeah. Well, you know, the, so I ended up, I was there for six weeks. I said, yeah, hell yeah. I want to stay. Mm -hmm. I want to get me some of this auditing. Mm -hmm. And so I borrowed some money from my director friend who I later paid him back. And, um, Back then, the bridge, this was, you'll remember this uh, or know about this. This is when Dianetics was before the grades, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, Like the, the way it the works sequence, now is... The sequence of the, yeah. of, the, of the bridge or the steps you would do yeah, it changed. used to yeah. be a little so, bit different. Yeah, so yeah. when I was in, it was, it was radically different because the reason was is you did Dianetics and then you did your grades. And then supposedly what they discovered was a lot of people went clear on Dianetics. Right because that was the aim of Dianetics, um, though nobody's ever been able to really explain the difference between a Dianetic clear and a Scientology clear. <laughs> I didn't know there was a Dianetics reactive mind and a Scientology reactive mind, but apparently there is. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Nobody's so, been able so, to prove a reactive mind in the first place. The whole thing yeah, is Yeah, I so know, but just this but... is a thought experiment. Oh, totally. Can, totally. can we at least like try to differentiate the two and you can't. Right. Uh, so I was one of those people that did Dianetics before the grades. And so then when I, I think I did grade through grade one, uh, later I did some grades because they made you go back and do them. Right. But, but and then it was like, oh no, you're clear. So uh -huh. then um, I, I, so basically what happened was I did that auditing. I didn't know I would, the, the, they had not yet told, I'm not going to say I didn't know I was clear. They had not yet said, oh, you're clear. Right. And then I went back to college because my, the admissions department at CalArts had tracked me down and said, dude, if you don't show up for the next semester, you're going to have to reapply and you probably won't get in because the school's blown up and it's really hard. If you think it was hard to get into when you apply, that's really hard now. So I'm like, holy shit, I'm going to go. So I went back to college. And um, I, you know, I had done a bunch of Scientology. I'd gotten off the drugs. I'd done a bunch of auditing. I did all those courses and Student Hat, and which I attributed Student Hat to making it easier for me to study, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is kind of ridiculous because all they really needed to do was give me a post-it note that said, you might want to use a dictionary when you're right. studying. <laughs> so that's, right. really, that's really all you need. Like all right. of the technology in Scientology, if you boil the study technology down to anything that's helpful and valid, it's one thing, use a dictionary. Exactly. Uh, which is kind of common sense, right? Exactly. But a lot, a lot of people don't think of it. So then I went back to school. Then I got out of school. Then I got a really good job with a prestigious uh, production company. Mm. And uh, a bunch of shit happened. Not really that important to the story. Mm -hmm. And then um, in the mid 80s, they, uh, Jeff Hawkins was doing the Dianetics campaign. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So this is my second origin story. My first origin story was I was a drug addict with a dead girlfriend who got pulled in by a director and a celebrity uh, at CC. And then my second origin story is into working for Scientology, yeah. which is on the Dianetics campaign. Back oh, okay. In the 80s. Okay. And yeah. this was, this so, was mid eighties, wasn't it? Yeah. This is about, I think it was around 85. Was, uh, yeah. Cause uh, Hubbard had not died yet. 
No, no, no. He was. But Dianetics yeah, was, was going to get revamped, and 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 Jeff oh, Hawkins was the sort of the mastermind, or was one of them working yeah, on no, this thing? Yeah, no, he was no, not just sort of what he Jeff, was absolutely one hundred percent the only person in the world who could have pulled that off and gave a shit enough to do it. Right. And what he pulled off was absolutely brilliant and amazing. Yeah. And his reward for it was to get the shit beat out of him by David Miscavige. That's right. That's exactly that's right. Just, that's yeah, exactly just right. The way that it works. So uh, what was your involvement with that? Oh, so they had done some TV ads, mm -hmm. right? Which I had seen. And um yeah, anyway, they they were whatever. They were uh, Were these the question ads? No, that that this hasn't was before happened that. Yet. Yeah, this was before that. Before that. Yeah, 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 they had done one with John Brody. The, the, the sort of a celebrity testimonial John Brody had been the, oh, he was okay. a former former quarterback for San Francisco 49ers I think the uh that's the football team right 49ers isn't the San Francisco 49ers I mean I was born up there I, I don't know why I don't know uh, I don't know anyway so John Brody <laughs> is a very famous NFL ex-quarterback he had a near career-ending car crash uh, he received some dynamic auditing he uh attributed it to his recovering physically mm. so he did a testimonial app for them and then they did a couple of fake testimonial apps. you know one was a marine biologist one was a mountain climber and i i thought they were kind of uh prosaic uh kind of trying to be like other ads right but, right which is not good marketing because if if you know you Hubbard always out. said, yeah but he always said Dianetics is new, right? Remember mm -hmm, that? Mm -hmm. New news. Dianetics is new. If it's new, it shouldn't have commercials like other people's commercials. That's right. So they were looking for somebody. They were looking for a Scientologist. I was I was a known entity. I was public at Celebrity Center. Everybody, a lot of people knew me and knew that I was a commercial director. Uh, and I mean, I, you know, I spoke with Janice uh, Grady the other day mm -hmm. and uh, or we were emailing back and forth, but I had forgotten when I was working at this company, Robert Abel and Associates, where, which is, where, is it, half the people that worked in special effects on the original Star Wars came out of that company. So it was like a significant kind of company right in the middle of Hollywood. And I was had just started there. I ended up being creative director of the company, but I had just been out of film school. And Janice told me, she said, do you remember I came to your office and hung out with you? I had completely forgotten about this, but somehow she had just finished a mission at AO and was had a day before her flight back to go back to the ship. And somehow uh, Yvonne had gotten a hold of me and said, hey, can my daughter come and hang out with you? I think you guys should meet each other. Like, so she came and we hung out. I mean, she told me stuff that I was some anyway, whatever. It was amazing. So hmm. so a lot of people kind of knew me, right? Yeah. And yeah, so, yeah. And so then this marketing person from uh well, marketing wasn't at gold then it was in la right it was called central, central C cmu marketing. right central yes, marketing yeah, unit. central marketing unit yeah uh this and then later it became the strategic book marketing unit mm -hmm. sbmu but mm -hmm. cmu was in the complex right that that's that right that's horrifically right blue painted edifice that's to, right i don't know what yeah they were there and so this woman came to me and she said she was a, a Sea Org executive. She's no longer in the Sea Org. Right. Wonderful woman. She's teaching children art in San Francisco. And um, she came to me and she said, we need somebody to direct some TV ads. I guess she looked in my ethics folder or something because she said, I don't really care if you're a sex pervert. <laughs> we just need somebody. We'll just overlook it. I mean, she was she made like this joke. Mm. The joke was not, it wasn't at me. It mm -hmm. was, this is how desperate we are. Mm. You get what I'm saying? And then yeah. I always used to joke that because of what I had done for gold, that if I had, I would have to probably kidnap a busload of orphans, addict them to heroin and burn down a mission before I would get a, a comment. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So in and other then, words, you were considered a valuable property. By yeah, the for a long, yeah. long time. And, and then right. eventually, you know, it, it happens to everybody. I mean, I wrote in my book, if you work for Scientology long enough, you will be you will be ridiculed, traumatized, and everything you've done will be credited to someone else, mm -hmm. and you'll be given the blame for things you didn't do. That's right. It's that's the outcome. It's just how it goes. Mm -hmm. So 
she came to me and then she introduced me to Jeff. And I was like, you know, let's do this. Let's rock and roll. Let's make some ads. He pulled in another guy who was Scientologist, old OTA, who'd been a creative director at like Shia Day and had worked for that uh, the big agency in Chicago. I can't think of it. I mm. just don't remember the name. Uh, and we did some stuff. And then Jeff had this idea, which was, I think, one of the most brilliant, I definitely in book marketing, which was the questions ads, right? which were hugely successful. So when Jeff started his whole campaign, the book between 1950, when it was published, and 1984, 85, it had sold 3 million copies. Mm -hmm. Three years later, by the time we were done rolling out all these ads, it had sold 13 million. So in a matter of like three years, we sold like 10 million books. You took, you guys, your project, uh, Jeff at the helm, you working on the commercials yeah. and everything else. Yeah. You guys took a book that was 34, 35 years old. Yeah. And you got it back on the New York Times bestseller list. Legitimately. Legit. I mean, Legit. Not Scientologists the, going out and buying boxes and yeah, boxes with, of books. Yeah, like they did this stuff later. No, it was yeah. worse than that. It wasn't just Scientologists going out and buying it. Yes, I mean, right. I think, it was I legit. Jeff, yeah, but Jeff wrote about the illegitimate stuff, the way they, they really rigged it to get it on there later. Like they, sure. they rigged the game, but we got it on there legitimately. I, I hate to say we because it was really Jeff. I mean, he was the ad agency. I came in and provided some some creative ideas and some and I got them done. I mean, I you know, I got I got all the questions ads made because they didn't really have a way to do it. Mm. So because I had, you know, accounts with post-production houses and because I had relationships, I could go in and, you know, um, I mean, we had a, it was a like a factory. Like I had a post-production house because all the ads had the same design. Right. We, and they we were pretty just, they were pretty cookie cutter. I mean they were pretty simple. Yeah, ads, which, I mean, was, that was which was which was part of their power is they were just like, wow, yeah, what's this? You know? Totally. The other thing that people don't realize is that before the questions ad, nobody had ever made an ad where the featured visual in the ad was text. Right. Nobody had ever done that. And then after the questions ads that became a thing. The only text you saw on TV commercials was the disclaimer at the bottom. Right. You know, dealer <laughs> dealer prep and da not included, blah, 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 and then you'd see the text at the bottom. And then after that, all of a sudden it was title, boom, title. And that, you know, I don't know. I, I mean, in the history of, of television advertising, Jeff needs to get a credit for inventing the text-based ad because it became a thing. Um, and, and we could just phone it in. We could literally just send the post-production house like uh, just, well, I'm embarrassed to say it, but we could send them a fax. <laughs> wow. And they could put and it together. They just make the ad. Yeah. 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 Like we wouldn't even have to show up. They would just make it. And then Jeff had provided like a list, uh, a distribution list of where all, of all the stations where the ads went. And then there were some post-production houses who specialized and making sure that those got distributed. So the whole thing was just push button. It was crazy. Right. Uh, and Jeff Levin was the one who did the music for those. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah, here's the thing. Yeah, absolutely, Jeff did See, it. See, all mean, of you I, guys are out. All I've interviewed all yeah, of you now on my channel. It's so hilarious. Yeah, Jeff Jeff is an old dear friend. He was yeah. uh, at CC when I was there. He was no longer on staff there, but he was still public there. And Jeff right. and I were, were still friends. I mean, I still talk to him. Nice. He's a great guy. But... Um, yeah, I, my memory on this is really fuzzy. I know I listened to Jeff Hawkins tell this story, and he says he he tells it like it was like Tangerine Dream. He had this idea of a Tangerine Dream soundtrack, right? And I remember going to Jeff and saying, back in those days, uh, Intel. Remember Intel? Yeah, yeah. But do you remember their ads at the end of the ads? There would be this little motion a little motion graphic and it'll go bum 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 and it'll go intel inside bum bum oh bum. yeah 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 remember that that's right and i do remember heard, that yes yeah if you if you heard that today you'd you'd probably go oh that's intel that's right that's yeah right. so i thought that was such a clever idea uh, i'd only seen it on tv like cbs and nbc they had these little bum bum these little audible s signatures yeah and i thought that was such a brilliant idea that i told jeff we need one for dianetics so i remember that giving that assignment to Jeff Levin and sitting down at the piano with him. And then Jeff says it was him and, the, and Chris Meany, 
Maney, mm-hmm. right? Who who was married to uh, uh, what's her name? Uh, Maney, uh, his wife. She wrote a book. Blah blah blah. And it doesn't matter. So his partner back then, Chris Maney, he did, the two of them did it. So according to me, I suggested it as an Intel inside type of audible signature, like an audible logo. Yeah. Yeah, right? yeah. Audio logo, I guess you could call it. Jeff says he he came up with it and it was based on Tangerine Dream. <laughs> and then Jeff and then Jeff Levin says it. But, but I have this I have this mental picture in my mind of sitting at a piano bench next to Jeff Levin because we'd done some he I he'd done some commercials for me some composing and uh, as well as David Campbell and you know I worked with all those guys and uh, I remember him going dot 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 on it. So it's really funny. I, I've never really confronted Jeff about that. I mean, I'm in communication with him and I sent him part of my book and we've talked and whatever, but I never really, you know, and he said nice things about me in his book. And I said nice things about him in my book. So, but, yeah, we're it, not, we're not going to have some, you know, duke him here over who came up with the no, dynamics no, no, music. No, no, funny. no. I think it's funny. I don't yeah, think we totally. ever would. I think we would, we would all laugh that we remember it, that exactly. signature differently because okay, flash forward 15 years, maybe. Mm-hmm. And, you know, after Miss Gavage completely dismantled marketing in LA, mm-hmm. ordered it to come to the base, found me because who's this person directing all these ads in LA? We I just didn't do questions ads. I did an animated ad, a high-end computer animation ad uh, called, mm-hmm. uh, it was the, uh, what was it called? Maze, that was the Maze ad. Uh, I'll find it. I'll look oh, to, I remember I'll, that. I know what yeah. you're talking about. The dyna- with, yeah. there, there's a there's like a labyrinth presented. Yeah, and you're, labyrinth, and you're, yeah. And you're kind of the camera's yeah. kind of shooting through it, and then yeah. it's kind of like Dianetics will solve this for you or whatever. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. I remember uh, so that commercial. We, yeah, we did a bunch of cool stuff. So uh, Miss Gavish was always trying to reboot Dianetics, which he's never going to be able to do because he'd have to apologize to to Jeff Hawkins to begin with. <laughs> but, he can never do. but so. There was this concerted effort back in the two thousand in the earlier uh, to reboot the campaign. So the first thing they did at Market oh, at, at Gold, and I had been invited up there because Miss Cabbage discovered me through the Dianetics ads, right? Oh, okay. So marketing at Gold, they decided to do a, a statistical graph of book sales starting in nineteen ninety, mm-hmm. right? And the graph was a little bit rocky, right? Up and down, up and down, up and down. And I looked at the graph and I said. Why did you start at 1990? You needed to start like 1984 Mm because the big sales were in the 80s. And they said, well, we tried that and you'll understand this. Mm -hmm. Um, And then we'll have to explain it. But it flattened the graph. Right. In other words, the scale of the earlier sales were so high compared to the current sales that if you tried to graph them all on one graph, it would crunch together and yeah. you wouldn't really be able to read it very well yeah. because of yeah. that so, scaling Yeah, problem. everything after 19, 1990 on would be a, a flat line of the bottom. Right. Nothing. There'd be nothing. Right. Because so they, they were so that. pathetic in the sales yeah, it was so then pathetic. compared to yeah. what was happening when Hawkins' campaign was going. Yeah. And this is a famous thing I think they do organizationally in the Sea Org is oh, yeah. just pick the section that looks really good and get yeah. rid of the one that shoves it down. That's right. So... Um, I saw a lot of graphs in Scientology like that, by the way, guys. It's yeah, not, yeah. I was in management at West US and I didn't have access to the international statistics, but I could right. see what would happen with these peaks and then these crashes. And it was it's a routine pattern in Scientology and it indicates exactly Miscavige's leadership style, which is kill the successful people because yeah. He just doesn't like them for some reason, or because they're successful, or because yeah, their their name is somehow you know important all of a sudden, and his isn't, or he didn't yeah. come up with the idea. We could come up with a million reasons as to why, but this is his management style: is yeah, you know, yeah. kill the and, producers. Yeah, and I, I not to toot my own horn, but I had come up with a lot of very successful things. But still, he got so much of the credit for it because mm-hmm. I was his cherry pick golden boy. Right. And plus, I wasn't in the Sea Org, so then he could use the fact that I wasn't in the Sea Org to ridicule Sea Org people. I had to go outside the Sea Org and get somebody to do your job. He loved to just impugn the staff, which is... Um, That's what I'm talking about right there. What's that? That's what yeah. I'm talking about right there, yeah. right? Is Is somebody who really seems to get joy from oppressing people. You know, yeah. from making them feel bad 
about themselves, about their work, about their life. Yeah. He just seems to get off on that. And it's a really yeah. sick trait, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's it's tough for, you know, I was treated really well for by him for years, Chris. I know that. I mean, I know that that also fits into the whole nar narcissistic, you know. Well, it's because he's, you about. serviced him in a number of ways, yeah. including him being able to use you when even when you weren't around yeah. to, you know, to run control and, you know, and punish these people for existing. You know, it was it's yeah, it's his thing. Yeah. yeah. And the last letter that I received from him was in response to a note I wrote to him was back in 2018. I, I was back at oops, I got it. I was back at gold and uh, after having been busted at s and um, when finally it all caught up with me and blah, 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 you know, my personal life and my life working for them and it all went. And then it, there's comes to a certain point where nobody, nobody cares about like your achievements in the past. Right. You know, the right. saying in Hollywood, they say you're only as good as your last picture. Mm -hmm. Well, Greg Wilhere, who I was close with for a time, uh, who was one of the people that like oversaw my onboarding at gold. He went, he came to me and he said, well, you got to remember you're only, uh, this was way back in the early days, but he said, yeah, you're only as good as your last effect. So, right. Right. Like that, yeah. That's the science that's right. version of it. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and mm -hmm. so nobody's gonna, no, it's black and white thinking. Well, you've talked about that. Oh yeah. But it's just, oh, it's yeah. the hate the black and white thinking. Uh, so anyway, I got off uh, track a, a little bit there. So, yeah, yeah, we were talking uh, oh, about yeah. the Dynetics campaign, oh, yeah. so, and that's kind of yeah, how you got into so, it all. So they were they were trying to reboot it. The, this yeah. anecdote I was trying to tell you, they were trying to reboot it. They did the funny thing with the with the graph, and then we did some focus groups, which uh, mm. I hate focus groups. <laughs> uh, I will do it. You know, all of the great things that emerged in the world. None of them were focus groups. Steve Jobs didn't focus group the Mac or the iPhone or the iPod, you know, mm -hmm. like, um, you know, Elon Musk didn't focus group the Tesla. And right. it, to some people, they have great ideas. They believe in their ideas. They have creative ways of announcing their ideas, which in a nutshell, that's what advertise does. It just is a crazy great way of announcing that you have something that's worthwhile. Uh, so, and I was always like, no, if you have a great project and you re a product and you really believe in it and you have a crazy, great creative way of announcing it, just fucking go for it. Don't be, you know, you know, don't be, you know, you, let me just tell you an anecdote. The, the modern focus group that we all know about, you know, where they bring in a group of people and they pay them 40 bucks and they ask them questions that was invented to test a certain product and nobody remembers what it was, but it was the Edsel. Okay. Oh my so, God. Really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, and I always used to point this out to them. I'd say, why do you want like focus group? They're a disaster. They gave us the Edsel. Like, like, you know, there's this old saying, I think I learned it from, I, I studied film and, and also graphic design and, and fine art. That was kind of like my metier. And uh, I had a design teacher, a really noted designer, and he used to say that uh, he didn't make this up, but uh, he used to say that a uh, uh, camel was a horse that was designed by a committee. Right, right. right. So, you know, we've all heard that, but that yeah. was the first place I heard it. So it, it, that's so, but we did focus groups and, and I went, me and I had a partner, she no longer, I, I don't think she's in Scientology, but she has notable in-laws, so she's not going to ever... Stuck. Sure, sure. Um, but we went to these focus groups, and one of the things that was asked of them, we had a group run it for us. You know, they were paid a lot of money. Mm -hmm. and this was after Jeff had left, right? Mm -hmm. He wasn't part of this, right? Uh, Jeff Hawkins. And and so one of the things that they, you want to do like a kind of memory impression test, like do you remember ever seeing a Dianetics ad? Do you remember what was in it, right? So one of the things was, do you remember? And then we played the dit dit the theme, and they were like, "Oh my god!" And this one kid was like, "Yeah, I was eight years old," <laughs> and it was just crazy because it's like hundred percent. Yeah, people associated uh, that signature with Dianetics. So not only did Jeff come up with this wildly successful book campaign, but he also somehow. Uh, 
I can't say he came up with, but but he it, under his tutel under his scholarship and his leadership emerged this signature, which became one of the most memorable sounds in the history of TV. There's the Dianetic sound, there's the Intel, then there's Alka Seltzer plop plop this this. Yes. Right? Yes. And then there's uh there's one for, a brilliant one for a coffee company. I think it was U Band, and it was a percolator. Da, 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 dun, dun, da, da, dun. Yes, the percolator? that's right. Yeah, and I that's it. That. And that's it. There's been like four like sounds that were used to identify products right. in the pantheon of television uh, broadcast advertising, and one of them is Dianetics. So you know, yeah. but not only we were we never able. Uh, I could talk to you endlessly about Dianetics. I mean, I have so many anecdotal stories about that, but. Not it was, but at one point I told Ms. Gavin, I said, no, you just got to redo the questions campaign. I said, the reason it worked is because it dropped into a vacuum. It was a literal vacuum. Uh, it, back in those days, mm -hmm. nobody associated L. Ron Hubbard with Scientology. Believe it or not, they did surveys. And the name recognition L. Ron, was associated with Dianetics, not with, because it was not that, you know, it was had been huge in the 50s and right. all that, that stuff. And so... Uh, and Dianetics did not have a negative connotation like Scientology did. Right. So Dianetics, and you know this, was used as a Trojan horse to then bring people into Scientology. That's right. Like that is their Trojan horse. So then I, then I told Ms. Scavage, I said, nobody remembers the questions as. We just need to redo it. Like honestly, legitimately, you know, maybe make the text and whatever, may, maybe slightly update it so that people know that it's new who remember the old ones. But we just need to do that. So uh, I I had I, I cut some together. I went through the book because I didn't have Jeff. You know, he actually wrote pretty much all of those. So I went through the book and I wrote a ton of them, you know, you know, ideas of, that would be, and, and I had them put together. And then I went into the editing bay and I looked at it and I'm like, what? This is not... And the music, I said, hey, can you go into the archives and pull out the original questions ads? And so the original question ad, the the signature goes dut, 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 and the new one that they had went dut, 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 dut. Uh, because okay. over the over the years they had used it at, at events, at big international events. And because the events are so adrenal, adrenalized. Oh, they had sped so, it up a little bit. It's slowly over the years, like you could lay out all of the versions over the years that they played at the events. And then over time, it would it, the, the meter of it would increase and increase and increase. Oh, interesting. And it, it was actually hard to get them to slow it back down because mm. they felt like they were altering, you know, like an alter is kind of thing. But... Yeah, that's, that's, yeah, it was, it, it never got going again. I mean, hmm. they never got it going. The Dianetics campaign it never got going. Then, then we did, you know, I did the How to Use Dianetics, which was then part of a seminar, which I helped design the yeah. seminar, like what the layout of the seminar is. And then the idea was, you know, they'll market the heck out of the seminar and they'll get people in the seminar and then they can Trojan horse them. In it. But it's just never worked because it's still bullshit. Plus, in all honesty, you know, Ms. Gavage, and I, you've talked about this, he led this campaign away from selling services to going on straight donations. Right. Right. I mean, obviously, that was his thing, because honestly, I think, based on conversations that I had with him, yeah, um, that to some degree, to a great degree or a small degree, but to some degree, he was inspired to do that by the Mormon Church. Oh, now like, that's an interesting point because yeah. because I know that the, that the Mormon marketing has influenced Scientology with the ask a ask a Scientologist or that the meet a Scientologist campaign. I think the Mormons started something like that. No, we, uh, actually, was it us gone who back started? And forth. Was it Scientology yeah. who started that first? Yeah, and then the Mormons copied. And it. then the Mormon, Mormon copied that. Okay, so it yeah. was okay because I couldn't. Yeah, I yeah, was, no, but it, it was always a question ways. to me who started that. And yeah, I no, assumed, you're not. You're okay. not wrong. We were okay. all we were all complimented because yeah. no, basically the meta Scientologist was based on some ads done for uh, military recruitment. Oh, they did these ads. That's they didn't really call where it was inspired it from. Yeah, there was. They, they were showing a bunch of just, you know, hey, my name's, you know, I'm cute and I'm gung ho and. 
Yeah. And they sort of did these little bits and uh, it came from that. And then the Mormons copied it, but it went back and forth because back before I was at gold, there was a very famous uh, Joe Pitka, the very famous commercial director, one of the most famous ever. He did like the Michael Jackson Coca-Cola ads ah. and a bunch of really, uh, the, he did the, the Pepsi ad with uh, uh, Michael, what's his name? Uh, Michael J. Fox. Like he'd done all these. Oh, he did the Mean Joe Green. Uh, either oh, he wow. Partner. He did the Mean Joe yeah. Green commercial. Yeah. It was either he or his partner, Rick Levine. Oh, okay. There were these two guys, Pitt and Levine. They were like pay or play million dollar commercial directors, superstars in the 80s. And Rick Levine had done these brilliant heartstrings ads for the Mormon church. Uh, like, like little family moments, like a kid, you know, playing in the mud with his dog and, and he should just get brutalized by his parents. And instead they come out and grab a hose and hose him down and they all start playing. And so, you know, it's about like, we just need to love each other. Right. And they were, they were really good ads. Uh, right. I, I, Mormons are super clever about that kind of stuff. I, I had mm. shot some stuff before gold. I'd shot some stuff for Porsche up at the, the Salt Lake. I did some uh, films for them to anyway, whatever the, uh, car release films. Um, and so I hired like Mormon uh, crews up there who happened to be Mormon because Salt Lake is, I mean, the, we were on the Nevada Mostly side Mormons, the Salt yeah. Lake, but yeah. So, but they're super media centric. They do great stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know how we got into all that. But... Well, we were talking about the um, the Mormon the ads because you said it was. Inspired oh yeah, yeah, yeah. By so there was a couple of things. Mormons, there was a couple yeah. of things. Like I'd heard Mark Headley mention something about you know Mark was he was heavily involved in the systems. Like I was on mm -hmm. this team of people that was like i designed you know the the public di the public displays and all the ideal orgs oh yeah all those audio visual yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so things, that whole layout yeah. and how it works that was my project right like oh, i spent oh wow i spent i spent 18 months in the studio at gold building the ideal division six so oh, that wow. miss gavage knew how big it was so then he'd know how big of an org to buy that's where they arrived with sixty thousand square feet because we built a Div 6 in the studio and it was 20,000 square feet. So right. that's how the standard became, you know. So, 60,000 I mean, plus in terms of the size of the building. Yeah, yeah because, because he I, said I, a third of the organization third, has right, to be Division 6s. Yeah. yeah, that's the key number. And right. because he said a third, Miscavige knew he needed to buy buildings because the buildings were disgusting and he couldn't take Tom Cruise to them. Right. And that's not just a rumor because he told me that and showed me pictures of all the orgs and said, you know, like, blah, blah, blah. Aren't they disgusting? I mean, I, I had a firsthand conversation with him about that. Did, um, did you? Because that is a point that I've wondered about is oh, no, absolutely. how much is, no, no, was, no, it, the, was up, it Tom Cruise the, inspired? No, I showed up. Well, I'm not really inspired. I mean, I don't know that that's a bad thing. I mean, somebody comes along that, is of a world that 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 because of that you're reminded how shitty your world is and you need to upgrade it. <laughs> oh no, absolutely. That's not a bad thing. No, 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 it, not at all, not at all. But it's interesting how it does tend to how all the emphasis on it now counters what Hubbard was writing in his policies about how about what the priority of the organization should be. Well, as I wrote in my book, and, and there's a there's a policy somewhere, which you're more of a policy guy than I am. Sure, sure. Uh, but um, he wrote somewhere, they'll know us by our mest. Does that ring a bell? Oh, yeah. They will yeah, know yeah. us by Absolutely. our mest. Absolutely. Okay, it okay, wasn't good. that Hubbard didn't want good quarters. But right. his emphasis in policy was if you're not selling and delivering Dynetics and Scientology services as your number one priority, you're off the right. damn rails. And right. yeah, fix up the building, but don't make that the focus of your efforts. That's That was really sort of the heart of the point of the Debbie yeah. Cook email in, tw yeah. in 2011, right? Which which really blew open a lot of stuff for people because they were right. like, look at all these totally. quotes from Hubbard totally. where – you know, he's saying, don't do this stuff that, that Miscavige is on this complete roll because he he took the Scientology train and he definitely put it on a different track, you know? Oh, yeah, completely. Yeah. So, I mean, I witnessed that happen. Right. Like, That's I, why I'm so curious I, about what you have to say yeah, about I, it. No, yeah. I was, if anybody thinks, I mean, I wrote about this, Chris, if anybody thinks that David Miscavige connived the ideal org, uh, the, uh, the ideal org program as a money-making, land-grabbing scheme, they're completely wrong. 
it was 100% a serious effort to solve the problem of how to expand Scientology. Now, the, wow. when, and that didn't, but when that didn't work and all those orgs ended up empty, what does it look like? Yeah, it looks like a land grab. Yeah. Yeah, but, that's it. See, this is exactly the things I was going to, we were going to go toward talking about is, is your experiences with Miscavige on this. Because it's pretty clear you were involved and around in and out of his circle for years working oh, in yeah. the position you yeah. were in yeah. at yeah. Gold, right? Yeah. And, and yeah. you weren't just a film director. You designed the Division 6 layout. That is, that's, yeah. wow. That's Not a just lot a more than layout. just directing some oh, yeah. films, no, you know? I, I, I headed up the design team on wow. the Lord's Life exhibition. And I also was in charge of the Industry of Death Museum. Really? Uh, I, yeah, I designed that whole goddamn museum. I, oh, I, wow. I supervised all the films. I wrote half of them myself, directed half of them myself. Right. Uh, yeah, so I... Okay, okay. There got, there got to be a point where whatever, whatever it was, if it was anything visual, if it was like they bought one of the Hubbard houses yeah. and they did concept renderings of how they were going to design it, like, a, like what was going to be in it. Because you're not you're going to make it you're going to make it authentic to the time period and to mm -hmm. Hubbard being an inhabitant, but you're also going to want to put display things in there for the public to look at, right. like maybe some cases, maybe a video monitor where they could watch it, blah blah blah. So you know the the landlord office would submit you know renderings, beautiful computer renderings to him, and he'd say, "Did Mitch see this?" Like this happened all the time. Hmm. It, it was like. You know, if I was driving home on a Friday night to go see my family and I could get a call halfway home saying, we just got something. And it says, did Mitch see this? And you have to come back. And I'm like, did he say, did Mitch see this? And if he's halfway home, drag his ass the fuck back up here to look at it. Right. No, he. but and, and sometimes I would say, fuck you. And sometimes I go, oh, my God, because I just didn't want the grief. So, you know, whatever, I, whatever. Right. Or, oh, we heard that there's this traffic. Uh, I don't know if you ever explained, but every written piece of paper that flies around the Scientology universe, especially from Miscavige, is referred to as traffic. Yes, right? yes. Yeah, and so you get this little message on your phone that says you have traffic, which means <laughs> something's coming down to you, and you better just go someplace where his communication runner uh, can find you and hand it to you. And it's very uh, stifling. It's very it's sort of traumatizing because you're – position in space becomes uh, the subject of somebody else's, uh, you know, what do you call it? The Not your own, so, so to mm, speak, right? Mm. So, but anyway, yeah. So what happened with that was one day, um, well, you know, you, I, did you ever get to go to the Industry of Death Museum? I actually helped build it because I was on the RPF okay, when that opened. Oh, okay. Then I probably saw you in there. <laughs> you probably well, did. I, well, I, <laughs> I yeah, might have because, been around, Yeah. Yeah, because every one of those projects, like the life exhibition, and the, they were always halfway done and they were a disaster. And then I would get a call like, can you please go in and take this over? And my wow. heart would jump out of my chest and I realized blah, blah, blah. blah. And, uh, but I was, you know, I was good at solving those problems. It's probably the other reason why I would, you know, uh, I was in good stead because, you know, I'd make shit happen. Right. And, uh, <clears throat> but, yeah, that museum, like what a trip that was. Um, yeah, yeah, that was one it. where I, I went in and ripped like half the thing out. But okay, the thing I'm, I was going to say was okay, so that museum all, with the monitors and the, mm -hmm. they had the thing, I forget what we called it, where you could push the button and it would play. It had a huge play button because mm -hmm. I said, I want a play button that somebody can hit if they don't have arms or legs, right? They can just do it with, I mean, if they don't have hands, they could just hit it with their elbow. But that was the prototype for the public displays oh. because it was a self-guided tour right and then that gave miscavige the idea oh we need to do that in div six we need a self-guided tour with video panels with lots of videos they can watch let so, me ask you a question since we're on sure. this right now and i have a million questions um which i'll just roll out as we go and yeah, sure. and, and, and sure. this may or may not very likely is not going to be the only podcast you and i are going to do because oh, okay. i because i'm going to pick your brains man i got so many yeah, questions totally for you. and i but i actually what i want to do is i'm going to read your whole book and then we'll regroup but yeah great for this for the purposes of this one i do have some immediate questions and my first one is i definitely get the progression in time 
because I was in LA and around and saw these things happen and I see right. how the dots connect. My, my, my questions go in the direction of, it, it seemed very clear to me from an outside perspective after I got out that the Lisa McPherson debacle, disaster, seemed to change Miscavige in terms of his priorities with services of Dianetics and Scientology, where after McPherson, a lot of emphasis went on books and lectures and the bridge, uh, the, the, the materials guide chart. And let's right. get off of selling auditing as much because auditing, look what it does to people. I don't know, though. This is just supposition. No, I, that doesn't, that doesn't, I don't think that. Does, I, I did he think, ever say anything like that? Because I'm just no, kind of wondering. No, no, I was, think the, the Lisa McPherson thing, the tragic, no? the, the tragic death. Um, I think to him, it was like, ah, this is a weird analogy. But remember when the pandemic hit yeah. and he put out a thing that said, um, you know, it, he called it bull bait. Yeah. Well, Lisa McPherson was just bull bait. Like, really? Yeah, really? it was just. Uh, See, because I, I, th think... I, I thought that impacted him a little bit harder than that, given the legal attention that was right on his front plate. Well, I, I think in terms of after that, there were waivers, I think, if you. Yeah, ever, like, contracts yeah, like, changed. Uh, yeah. yeah, you couldn't you couldn't show up at uh, I mean, it was just uh, I think all it changed was just like, let's get the lawyers together and figure out how we can prove ourselves. OK, OK, like, yeah, fair because, enough. I mean, fair enough. Because after that, what you had to sign, you know, you, they ask you when you go to flag, you know, have you ever tried to kill yourself? Oh, yeah. You did, yeah, yeah. If you have suicidal it. ideation in your history, you're not going to flag. Yeah, you're not going to stay at flag. You nope. can do services here, but you're going to stay down the street. So, mm -hmm. uh you know, if you have any kind of physical problem, like if you have a heart problem, if you have, uh, they're, they're not going to let you stay there. And then there was that wonderful uh, waiver that you signed saying that if you're uh, uh, involuntarily taken in by psychiatrists or whatever, yes, that they can take you over and take That's your right. care. And there's a there's a really weird story in my book that happened to me that I did a chapter on Miscavige. Mm -hmm. uh, and let me just qualify it by saying. The one thing you don't hear about him, mm -hmm. you hear about how evil he is, and you hear about how short he is, which I object to because I don't believe in body shaming. I don't give a sure. fuck who you are. Sure. Uh, um, and you hear all these things. You don't hear about how brilliant he is. Mm. So, you don't hear about uh, sanity is no mark of leadership. Mm. Hitler was a good leader. Mm. Even Nixon so sanity and leadership, but this guy is a powerful, brilliant, magnetic leader who is a, you know, like, like Hitler. And I, I'm not trying to play the Hitler card. Yeah, I, yeah. No, I get it. Just it, the, in the, the idea that, being it, you can be an absolutely terrible, horrific person with no moral like, conscience, but you can still have this intellectual brilliance. Yeah, yeah. And the scariest thing to me about... Uh, Miscavige is not that he's capable of punching you in the face, but he's such a brilliant tactician. Mm. That's to me the scariest thing. Mm. Like the way Hitler took over Poland. <laughs> mm. You know, I mean, eventually it all catches up with them and they end up biting down on a cyanide cat tablet. Yeah. But um, but yeah, he's the thing you don't hear about is how brilliant the guy is. And I've sat across the desk from him. Uh, maybe it's because he never personally punched me in the face. Uh, you know, Mike Rinder's not going to tell you how brilliant he is because. Right. Well, Rinder so, has acknowledged that Miscavige is yeah, an intelligent, okay. well-read man. He has yeah, said he those really, words. He, he is. He is. He's and almost the, as brilliant. The, the, he's almost as brilliant as Mike. I knew Mike. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing that is confusing, and let's go ahead and talk about this. So the thing that's yeah, confusing okay. about Miscavige from the outside, and I've spent years now trying to figure this out. And I've come up with conclusions or suppositions that I'm totally happy to be proven wrong about. So I'm not I'm not going to try okay. to argue okay. these points. It's just things I've been wondering about. And based on the available sure. data, it doesn't look like he's a true believer because he doesn't push the basic usual policies of Scientology. He pushes the most extreme nonsense. And that's his interpretation of Scientology. Since he's okay. taken over, there has been this shift to make it a worse brand of Scientology. We talked about how it was in the 70s under Yvonne versus how it's been under Miscavige. 
polar opposite difference. And this is, this is right. character. This is, this is his leadership manifesting right. itself. Right? Right. right. So you look Absolutely. at that from the outside and you go, well, here's a guy who's driving this thing right over a cliff. The image of Scientology went from nobody connected L. Ron Hubbard and Scientology up until the eighties. And then we got Dianetics where their name recognition really bounced. I remember uh, hearing when I was in the church that Dianetics went from like 15 or 10% name recognition to like 80 or 90%. Yeah, it was huge. In the United States because of that campaign, it was gigantic. Right. So now, of course, we come forward to, you know, 2023 after Anonymous and after all the, you know, going clear and after Leah's show and after all the exposure of all the years and the internet. And we see Scientology and L. Ron Hubbard's name synonymous now and reviled, absolutely toxic. Yeah. And that's Miscavige's product. And so right. I have to wonder how brilliant is this guy when this is the result of his work? But, uh, but you make a very good point that there's a difference between morality con and conscience and, intel and intellect. Maybe he's this really right. brilliant guy but he's brilliantly running it off the cliff. And I, and I keep wondering, what is up with this guy? And I can't see a true believer there, but you have said to me, no, no, he absolutely believes in this. And the ideal org strategy was an honest effort to 100%. try to expand the org. So please mm -hmm. tell me more about all of this. Yeah, the ideal org strategy was build it and they will come. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, really? So, uh, it really I mean, was that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 100%. <laughs> yeah. Listen, I feel the dream why strategy. Else, why else <laughs> would he have uh, spending like he shut down film production? Uh, well, actually, th there was another director who'd come up from Australia, like a the B tier guy, B team guy. Mm -hmm. And he was off doing some stuff uh, on location to keep film production going. Uh, but I spent his main person, I spent. 18 months in the studio building a prototype, you know, the same way that Apple did the Apple store and McDonald's does their stores and Starbucks sure. does their stores. They have little studios somewhere where they build prototypes, they shoot ads. Well, McDonald's maintains a, a full soundstage with mm -hmm. a McDonald's restaurant. So that, so, uh, and we worked with a Gensler architects, you know, the company that, that it's the world-class, the one of the biggest architecture firms in the world yep. that, um, you know, designs all the audio works. They, at least back then, at, at the time when I was working on the ideal, on the, the, the Div 6 displays, they have a team in San Francisco that worked on Nike Town and worked on the Apple Store. And we interfaced with them to turn over our proof of concept on the displays so that they could deploy them to the different orgs. Right? Right. So, you know, this well, was even like, that Even that point, let me ask you, let's, let's hone in on a couple details. Because even that sure. point of the Division 6s, the very first thing I thought... When I saw as an old school and your old school Scientologist, I mean, as an old school oh, yeah. Scientologist, a 70s Scientologist, yeah, yeah, yeah. the thing that I thought watching that roll out was this isn't how it worked. This isn't how Scientology expanded in the 70s is, is computer displays no, and an impersonal it, it always, approach. It was, yeah, it was hands it always, on friendly <laughs> contact. Yeah. Why would Miscavige yeah. say the com course isn't what boomed Scientology in the 70s and, and robot tech is how we're going to expand it? It it boggles me that he thinks that's actually going to work. Uh, the, yeah, okay, so I'll, I'll give him my opinion. Yeah, uh, tell me, please. Mind, keep, in, keep in mind, nobody can get inside of anybody's head. Oh, no, no, no. I'm only asking within your experience, of course. Yeah. Of course. What, what I, yeah, I mean... Um, I can, I can positively absolutely tell you David Miscavige never said to me whether he was a believer or not a believer. Sure, sure. Uh, so uh, whatever. Uh, I, I think he fully believes that. I mean, he's. I had conversations with him early on about how he fully expects to achieve a state where he can come back and remember his entire existence. Okay. Like he, we've had I had all kinds of conversations about that. So. Okay. Um, so yeah, I don't. I think he hundred percent. I mean, I think he's under a, a certain kind of stress uh, mm. from the fact that Hubbard has kind of been a no-show. He's supposed to come back. Oh, really? Right. Well, right. I mean, what's the what's the motto of the Sea Org? Well, yeah, it is. Of course, we come back. But there's this OT8 issue, this HCO bulletin, which says he's going to maybe come back as a politician, maybe. Do you ever see that? Well, yeah. No, I've never seen it, but I've heard about it. But yeah. whatever it is, he was supposed to come back. 
Got it. I, I mean, people. Wow. Are so Miscavige still... actually is waiting for Hubbard to come back. I, I think so. I kind of, wow. in the back of my mind, I think he's going fucking crazy because um, when they, when they did the, the raid on Pat Broker and found yeah. out he didn't have the OT nine and 10, yeah. that wasn't a problem because Ron was coming back. So he's going to solve the whole thing. <sighs> Right, but okay. the longer you go, when he doesn't come back, yeah, right? <laughs> gonna, yeah, kind of becomes a big problem, right? Oh, is that so, what's stressing him out? Is that why you well, drink whiskey every that's night? Just, <laughs> that's just my own. That's just my own thing because he sure. he was he was very sensitive about not wanting people to to think of him as Soros. He he was very huh. sensitive about not not wanting the like the i don't want to say i don't know what the word is not adulation but just the notion of who is source like he didn't want that to ever be transferred to him like i he would really? say any number of times like yeah i want to do this thing but you know i don't want people to think that like i'm trying to be source because i'm not trying to be source you get what i'm saying so Wow, uh, that is was, really interesting because his yeah. actions have been the exact opposite. Yeah, no, I know, but wow. I know, I know, but I think, I think he was handed the reins or took the reins. Yeah, I think he took them. And, yeah, and the reins are the reins. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, I do. Yeah. I do. Yeah, I mean, I don't personally. I, I don't. I didn't know Pat Brook. I knew Annie. That's another story. Uh huh. And uh -huh. Annie was. You don't have friends in the sewer. You know this. Yeah. You have people that you're friendly with. Correct. But they're not friends. That's right. Because you can never confide in them. That's right. And the def one of the basic definitions of a friend or the, the roles of a role of a friend is someone you can confide in. Yeah. So I was friendly with a lot of Seward members, some of them very much so that I had a kind of a familial, not familial, but friendly love for them. Like, wow, I really like this person. So Annie Tidman was one of those people. Uh, yet I was mm. in such a bubble. I never knew till after she died that she was Annie Broker. Right, right. Because like, of course not, she I was probably not. some. I mean, was she treated well by Miscavige? Um, well, she wasn't treated badly. I mean, I remember okay. when she left. I didn't really know her before she left with her ex-husband. Okay. Logan. Okay. But she, when um, she, I knew her. She hung out in the 90s mid late 90s early 2000s she spent a lot of time with the crew because she was part of cmo gold right cmo gold was this right the, you know the commodore's messenger organization that oversaw gold which uh excuse me eventually um uh miscavige completely disbanded them but I, I, when i was brought to gold by cmo gold like that group, that was the group that onboarded me. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, which would make sense. And, she, and Annie was part of CMO Gold. So, and she was great. Like, if you were having a down day, Annie was a person you could talk to mm. and she could, she would give you some advice. Okay. You know, I was having yeah. a terrible day one day. And, and she said, you know, I remember I was like 12 years old and I was having a terrible day. And, and uh, LRH came up to me and he noticed I was having a terrible day. And he said, you know, Annie, anything possible and he said that really brightened my day so you know i i usually uh had a kind of disdain for people that would she rarely talked about her experiences but i didn't like hearing the, these stories because i thought it was people kind of usually when you'd hear them people would, would use them to to uh, inflate their importance like oh you know back oh. when i worked with ron he told me and it was just like that was kind of like fuck you Oh you know, wow! Um, How interesting. Of course, Annie, yeah. Of course, Annie wasn't. Annie wasn't. Like and she that. wasn't like that. She, no, right. she was such a delightful person. Right. So sweet. And, so um, so okay. Let me let's go back to Miscavige for a second. So so Miscavige. Yeah, we got off the track. No, no, it's totally fine. We got so many tracks, and there is so much stuff to explore here. Um. So when Miscavige is going after these guys legally, or when he's going after the enemies of the church or whatever, he really believes he's taking out people who are trying to destroy mankind. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And no, he the reason, really thought... I, I now, so, so, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I wrote about this in my book. It, 
if David Miscavige puts you on rice and beans for three months or punches you in the face, it's only because he honestly believes you have done something to damage or interrupt or threaten the mission of clearing the planet. Wow. Like that's the way he responds to that. You know, I, uh -huh. I don't know. You could psychoanalyze the guy. I mean, he grew up in a chaotic home with an abusive father. And oh, blah, yeah. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah. We've done this. We've so, done this talk. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so, you know, you yeah, could yeah. do all that stuff, but. No, but no, yeah, no I, yeah. I think he really, I think he really does. And, and, okay. Uh, See, a lot really rides on this question of his belief in Scientology. It really makes a difference as to how we yeah, view no, him or I think, think about I him. I think it's far more dangerous that he believes all that. Yeah, and I do too. He's just, then he's just like, you know, running a Ponzi scheme because he wants to, you know, take off with whatever, blah, blah, blah. Well, what it know? indicates is that he's actually a radicalized Scientologist. See, oh yeah, absolutely. you see what I mean? Like, like we yeah. we yeah. we were not people who would walk around punching people in the face. Like that wasn't our thing. And in the Sea no. Org, when that happened, no. it was like at my level when that kind of thing happened, and it did. It yeah. was extraordinary. It was like, what the hell? You know, it wasn't like a daily occurrence that we were getting no. beaten on. However, it happened, and it happened frequently yeah. enough that it became yeah. a problem. But with Miscavige, yeah. this is a this is this can be a daily thing, and and that's a radicalized state of mind, which I'm just going to say, from my knowledge, is like that's a really really dangerous place to be. I talk about yeah. these spectrums all the time, and so I always had the idea that Miscavige was fully aware of the fact that this was basically a con, and that he kind of somehow I knew at one point he was a true believer, but I figured he kind of changed his you know his thinking. Because I thought he was kind of intelligent enough to see this is kind of crap, but apparently not. And that actually so. is worse. I mean, I, That's actually I really, worse. I really don't. Th yeah, it is yeah, worse. It's kind of scary. I mean, it, it's tough for me to talk about because, you know, I mean, the last letter I have from him, which is in 2018, he's referring to me as a friend. You know, he's right. saying, he's saying, oh, well, the HCO and SMP, they... They didn't want to tell me what happened because they know you and I are friends. It's just a fucking lie because it, it's like saying, like, if he asked them what happened, they're going to tell him. Like, oh, nobody, of course. Nobody says, uh, nobody well, says I'm not no. Gonna tell you, I'm not yeah. going to tell you what happened because you guys are friends. Uh, but anyway. <laughs> get, no, nobody's going to say that to Miss Cabbage. <laughs> no, nobody. But getting back to uh, the Div 6 thing because we were talking about Yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's that, go ahead. So, yeah. Uh, Yes. Yeah, so I, I I definitely think that it was genuinely intended to be what is described to be. And it, it became what it is, uh, is what makes it look like this land grab. I mean, I do think there's yeah. truth in that it was motivated by uh, the IRS, you know, the, the requirement that the church has to be a benefit to the community. And, and so with the idea orgs, you had this, super focus on the SBCs, you know, the social betterment groups. Right, right. The initial briefings on this were, in fact, that the orgs were supposed to be a central hub of yeah. all of this field yeah. activity. And the way yeah. he described it yeah. was they're supposed to be flag for their area. Yeah, exactly. And that I and I do think that that is 100 percent motivated by being able to yeah, I mean, it's a really clever thing that you can say, buy a building, buy a community center, whatever, and make it a benefit to the society. You have, sure. the, you know, you, you have a drug, uh, a drug awareness educational program, you have the morals program, you have all this different stuff. And you can easily say, well, look, we do this with our own money, but they also do it in a building that they have acquired and own. So that also protects their assets. Of course, in, in of course. terms of maintaining the reserves of cash that they have, so right, it's just a clever way of doing it. But it it doesn't mean it was done for that reason. I mean, had it worked, I know a guy. He happened to be a Scientologist. He's a film director. He raised a bunch of money. Uh, unfortunately, he raised it in a funky way from a bunch of old people and drained their retirement funds. The movie was a flop. Uh, he made the mistake of raising more money and then using that money to pay back early investors. Mm. That's called a Ponzi scheme. He ended up mm -hmm. going to jail. He got acquitted on a technicality. And I always used to joke that he he went to jail for making a bad film because had the film been a success, he could have paid everybody back and he, 
he wouldn't have had to do that. So it's kind of like the same analogy. Right. The film was a flop. Right. Okay. Right. The idea works. They're a flop, but he, my friend, didn't make the film just to bilk a bunch of people. No, it's understandable now. I get that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like he didn't do this just to own building. Right. Right. But of he, course, he'd want to own the buildings because who else could own them? Well, it's and see, then plus, it solved a lot of problems at all levels because bailing yeah, orders exactly. out on their rent money or their mortgage payments was a disastrous problem yeah. that repeated right. on a monthly basis at continental right. management level. And I so, can imagine. Oh, it was awful, and and it was a frequent activity because these orgs were not viable. And right. and they couldn't get themselves viable, and then they would, right. and then they'd have these inflated payments, or they'd have a property tax payment, and we'd have to bail them out. And so buying the buildings solved that problem. And I thought it was great initially, you know, but then the way it rolled out, their idea, as we say, they're idle morgues. They're not ideal yeah. orgs. Right? Yeah. Well, <laughs> in terms of the buying them with parishioner money. Works for the Mormons. <laughs> you know, oh so. no, I'll tell you, absolutely. Yeah. No, the, the 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 game plan, I get the template. I really do. And had it been yeah. a success, he'd be rolling in it right now. But it's the exact opposite oh, yeah. of success. Yeah. I mean, imagine you know? it would be phenomenal. Right? Oh yeah. He'd be he'd yeah. be uh, you know, oh, he was such a genius. But but he implemented this thing that was just so bad. Let me ask you about something different. Sure. Let me ask you about something different, because it's very obvious to anybody with some gray cells, right? I mean, you look at this 20 years out. We're 20 years out from the ideal org program being implemented about, right? right. 2003, 2004, something like that, right? right? When we were first right. hearing about it, the, the, right. the Buffalo Project, and then that rolled right. into this whole thing. Right. It's obvious this isn't working. This is not booming orgs. Right. Does he know that? Because I know the binders he gets sent. I've made some of them, right, from Twin Cities. I mean, we, we did everything we could to show him success. Is he so insulated that he doesn't get that that's not the real picture? I don't know. I can't really okay. answer that. I, right, I, would think that he, I would think that he knows. And it's a, it's a big kind of a shell game. And you got to keep it going because yeah. at some point you're going to hit, you know, the, this magic in, uh, number and it's all going to start working or Hubbard's going to come back and it's all going to, there's going to be mm -hmm. some big sea change. You just got to keep it going. You got to keep it going. You got to keep it going. I know that feeling of desperation. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I've not experienced it at that level. So I think he does know because, you know, he's shit canned all of upper management. All of those guys, you know, they got let out of the hole and they all have like mindless jobs, you know, converting analog material into digital. Um, oh, is that what's happening with them now? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, there, there's a project up at Gold. It's called the Analog Project. Really? What is uh, this? Well, I mean, you can imagine the amount of material that is not stored digitally that Scientology has accumulated, Scientology management at that level has accumulated over the years. You have films that are analog. You have TV commercials that are analog. You have paper that's analog. It was never entered into a computer. It doesn't exist. You have audio tapes. Well, I, all the lectures, the important stuff's all been digitized. There's a lot of stuff that hasn't. There's uh, mm. every tech film that was ever made. When they were done making it, all of the valuable documents from that film would be put into a footlocker or two to fill it up with on-set tapes of Heber, Hebert. He was recorded while he was making a film. Somebody shoved, um, you know, a, a recorder in his face. And then everything he did, every instruction he gave on editing and, or uh, shooting the film. So all this stuff is all analog. I mean, it's mountains of analog material, right? Yeah. And so they have a setup where they have every analog video player, every thing, every kind of scanner. Every, it's just like a technical wonderland. And you have these guys like huh. Guillaume and, and Greg Will here and these superstars of managers, and that's what they do all day. They they convert stuff from analog to digital, or they, they you know, gold is where they pack up the, you know, the titanium boxes that they put in the vaults. Right, right. Yeah, so all the material in those boxes is shipped to gold, uh, as well as the boxes, bo uh, gold packs the boxes. They're the, the, the port of demarcation for all the material going into the vaults. And then they do the, the only part of the content that they work on are the film restoration, the film, whatever film elements are going into, they work on those, which they 
they're an advanced facility. They're like a NASA facility. Yeah, for, yeah, yeah. I know they've history. invested big bucks in that. Yeah, so it's pretty amazing because I worked on the film restoration aspect of it. Okay. So um, does he, yeah, does he believe it? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, well, if, that answers a lot of key questions. Oh, no, but you, you were asking, you know? actually, you know, Chris, you were asking, does he know it? So he shipped right. all of those guys. Right. So where where else is the information going? I mean, I mean, I'm sure he knows it. I mean, how much can you fake it? You can't. Well, you the statistics are the statistics. statistics. Yeah. Yeah. And they're so down. I, I, I think <laughs> they he, down. Yeah, I think he does know. Uh, I think he he oh. continues to blame it on uh, people, and I've got to learn not to hit my mic. Oh no worries, no worries. You're fine. <laughs> is this does okay? He... This. Oh no, you're doing great. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. That's good. Does he ever? This is an important question, so if you need to think about it, go ahead. But have you ever seen him take responsibility for any of these failures? Um, uh, not in a mean. I'm trying to think. Uh -huh. Could you ca give, give me an example of a failure? Well, sure. You know, like, like you know, the, failure? well, okay. So we have, uh, well, a number of failures. We have Golden Age of Tech in 1996. Total flop. I mean, it, it was almost a schism. He destroyed field auditing. Missions right. are destroyed. Mission, the mission network has never recovered from what he right. himself did with his own two hands right. in the right. 1980s, right? right? And we can blame right. Hubbard for that, but it's been, you know, 40 years. It's like, where's yeah. the mission network, right? right. We have, um, you know, we have uh, the, the, the whole I help thing is a bit of a joke, right? Field auditors, that's gone nowhere. There's like a handful of them. Um, the uh, the ideal orgs, you know, from Buffalo to South Africa to San Francisco to every single one of them are dismal failures. They are empty buildings. Right. And we have, uh, you know, the golden age of tech killed training. I mean, the metering course was impossible to get through for years. Right. Golden age of tech two, you know, 15 years later uh, is necessary to revise it all and fix it. And it doesn't fix anything. So... You know, these are his programs based on his evals, based on his bright ideas. Right. Does he ever look at that and go, Jesus, did I fuck this one up? You know what I mean? Not that I know of. Um, I, 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 I do. I mean, he's run out of people to blame it on. So. Right. Because <laughs> he, he sacked everybody around They're all him, gone. You know? Yeah, they're all gone. So I, I don't know. I, I mean, I never saw that. I mean, I, okay. I, I, I've seen him apologize for things that are... You know, but uh, you know. Oh, oh, by the way, uh, you know, I so I sent you a reject the other day, and I thought about it, and I'm sorry, but I rethought it, and blah blah blah. You know, little things like that. Right, or, right. Um, but not big stuff, or even the hole no, for that matter. No, I mean, taking all no. these people who are OG. Oh, what hole? That never happened. What are you talking right? about? There oh, is no that hole? how that goes now? There was no it. hole. <laughs> no, it's uh, no, absolutely not. His way of apologizing it was. <laughs> You need to read my book. Uh, in twenty, some I, he <laughs> I, left I old. I will. I will. Yeah. If if let's just assume for a second that Hubbard is right that a person leaves an area because of the crimes they've committed in that area. Sure. Let's, let's assume, just assume that's let's assume correct. That. Yeah. Right. Then David Miscavige blew gold in early twenty fourteen, maybe late twenty thirteen. He fucking blew. Right, and he told me I am I'm I'm never coming back here because there's too many hurt people here that fucked me over. Yeah. What? Wow. Yeah, like he wow. literally made me believe that that line in the introduction to Scientology ethics is true. Oh, because I knew he had done this. Like I didn't know to what extent. Not until after everybody left and started speaking out, but I definitely knew something was going on. And then there's a story in my book about these three. Uh, uh, executives that he had that i turned a corner and he had these two men and a woman sitting on like the pavement in july it's like the pavement's got to be 120 degrees of black sidewalk and there's like tears and sweat streaming down their faces and knees and everybody this is right outside the dining room and everybody's walking to dinner passing them by and he's screaming at them in the top of his lungs and then i turn the corner and he looks at me while pointing at them and he screams like imagine screaming so loud that your voice hurt, that the veins in your neck were popping out, like just insane. And he screams, that's why you don't have a Dianetics campaign. And he screams this over and over and over in front of like everybody. Wow. And um, 
and he's in front of me, dude. I'm in the bubble of Scientology, inside the bubble of gold, inside the bubble of being a pro at gold. What the fuck are you? And then I was like, A, fuck you for drawing me into your little drama, uh -huh. because obviously my presence amplified their hum humiliation, right? Right. Because A, I'm, I'm, I'm not Seaworg, and, and, and I know all of them. I've worked with them. And plus, you know, just that statement, this is why you don't have a Dynamics campaign. No, we don't have a Dynamics campaign because you fucking punched Jeff Hawkins in the face and you dismantled the entire thing. Exactly. That's why we don't have a Dynamics campaign. So that was like a big turning point for me, even though I was still working there for another, I don't know, 10, 15 years. Mm. But that was the moment I, I told you before, but that was the moment when I realized uh, everything that I heard, okay, he punched Jeff, maybe Jeff deserved it. Nah, not anymore. I, I, like right. once I saw that, it was like, I, I'm not a believer it and you'll see it guy i'm a see it and you'll believe it guy right and i was and i went oh, oh if he's capable of doing what's in front of my eyes then anything i've heard he's capable of doing so that's right because that's right he loses it yeah like the guy does lose it uh and i've heard of people losing it i knew a guy who worked for microsoft and saw bill gates jump over four rows of folded chairs to strangle some guy who screwed up I had a friend who who did a presentation for Steve Jobs at Next Computers and said he was just the the most insulting asshole in that meeting that he'd ever met. But I'm like, these guys, you know, at that level, tensions are always going to run high and they're going to could potentially be explosive moments. Right. It's But it's rare. And mm. it's kind of in the context, kind of un, maybe understandable, maybe not forgivable. But with him, it's a management style, and it's it spreads like a virus. Like it, the man, the the extant management style at Gold, at least when I was there, is if your juniors, the people that work under there, if they don't fear you, you're doing a crappy job as a manager. If and they, that's exactly the attitude that rolls downhill from all him, the way down, all, yeah, all the, the way, way down. down. I mean, I was yeah. continental yeah. management. You know what I mean? I was yeah. middle. I yeah. was lower middle management, and that yeah. is that was our daily grind was just yeah. like that you know yeah you need to live in yeah it's it's about fear it starts from the top uh, so wow. yeah so so anyway <laughs> well how interesting how interesting this really helps clarify a lot of things now we're gonna have to move toward wrapping up pretty soon because yeah, we've, been, we've been talking yeah, for a right. while but there is since we're on this there's one thing i wanted to comment on about what you just said because sure. i wanted to give people in case anybody out there is like you know a little judgmental here about oh you saw this horrible thing and it took you 10 more years to get out my exit trajectory was 10 years too when i first saw the first yeah. big moment well just exactly like you just described where it became abundantly clear to me in an irrefutable way that shit was fucked up around here, right. basically. Right. It was 10 more years and a full RPF program before I could build up <laughs> yeah. the gumption to actually leave. So, so it, it matters when you're in it as opposed to when you're out of it looking yeah, in. You know what I mean? I, yeah, it does. Um, did you want me to comment on that? Oh, I mean, please, uh, if you want, if you have a comment on that. Sure. Well, for one thing, if you've not been in the situation, don't judge. Okay. Exactly. Because <laughs> you, you're never going to get it. The other thing is, I I was, I was many 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 years from working outside of gold, so I had no contacts, I had no connections. Um, I had a, I was paid well, respected, and and by all rights, when I look in the mirror and and recount this. I think, yeah, I should have just walked in my car right then. I should have just said, fuck you. Yep. Walked in my car, driven away, and taken the circumstances. So eventually I had to do that. And it's a lot harder now than it was then. Uh, but it was like I didn't do that. And part of it is the whole trauma bond. Mm -hmm. That's you're, right. You really, are, you really are stuck in it. And people don't, they don't they don't realize it and it, you know if they want to judge that's totally fine i mean i i uh i was in a group and as uh, that basically is uh a finishing school for narcissists uh yeah. i've only barely been able to start to emerge from my own assholiness uh that i was as a scientologist uh in terms of having this very inflated idea that you have knowledge that nobody else has and that does put you above them i yeah. mean it's a, it's a very complicated mindset that you're yeah. in. It's not a simple thing like, 
oh, you saw something bad. Why didn't you leave? It's, life never goes down like that. That's just not how it works. Exactly. So, Thank you for making can, that we, point. Yeah, we, we can talk about that. More yeah, at some other point, there's a lot of things we can talk about. Oh, absolutely! No, no. This, like I said, this is this is you know you and you and I have a lot to talk about. Um, but there is one more thing I want to cover since sure. we're on this topic, and since we're on the topic of you and gold and Miscavige, of course I have to bring up Shelley Miscavige. Oh, okay. Um, because the number one thing that the world is aware of outside of Scientology is where Shelley. It, that was yeah. put forward well, we by Leah where, Remini. We know where she is. It's well, we like, do. She's at CST, yeah. right? But yeah, the, the 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 message is is simple. It's clear. It's a hashtag. It's easy to understand. Everybody gets yeah. it. It's, yeah, now it's like a, me too. Yeah, exactly. It's like a punchline. John Oliver uses hashtag it. Hashtag worse chill. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So so you can ver Can you speak to that at all? Like, what was your experience yeah. with her? Well, I can give you my. My opinion, my yeah. perception of it for what it's worth. Um, I never, I did not interact. I interacted a lot. I knew Shelly a lot in the early days. Um, yep. I didn't interact with her post-wise because I just didn't need to. I mean, she mm. was not one of the people on my lines. Socially, she was. I We would we would interact a lot about, you know, gifts, whatever, Christmas. And, you know, we were friendly. Uh, uh, Shelly was, what can I say? She's a really, for, to me, she was a very charming person. Okay. Uh, okay. She was kind of, she was definitely Miss Gavage's good side. Uh, you know, I've heard, I mean, any, anybody in the, anyway, everybody in the Sea Org has a rough side. Um, mm. um, and mm. there will be people, okay, if you talk to Jackson, you know, Gary. Oh, yeah. Moorhead. Yeah. Talk to Jackson. I, when I spoke, he, he reached out to me not long, he'd heard that I was no longer in Scientology. And he reached out to me and he just wanted to say, you have no idea what how much you buffered the crew from all the bad shit that was going on because you came up there, and then no, and then I, he was uh, he said, Mitch, I was in charge of your clearances, and I was in charge of making sure that nobody fucked with you and that everybody like called you sir and blah blah blah, and uh, nobody gave you any shit. And he was like, like everybody was on their best behavior around here, meeting executives, Miss Cabbage, everybody else. Mm. And then we started getting films done. They had been banished to the kitchen for months and then i came up they came out of the kitchen we made films we got one done in record and faster than anybody even hubbard had ever done it so it was like and i was like what is this it was like it was like you know though this is a terrible analogy but it sounds racist but i was like the great white hunter who crash landed on the primitive island mm. <laughs> right mm. and everybody was like you're a god mm. so it was just like crazy um and then of course i became very friendly with that's the whole thing we need to talk about is like, just put a pin in that. Because yeah. when I discovered why they had to go outside to hire a professional, why? Right. Right. Why would they need to do that? Hubbard had written 500 executive directives on the subject of filmmaking, mm -hmm. all aspects of it. He compiled books. Ever since he was at La Quinta, he had been leading these, these people who were not filmmakers, but hey, I wasn't a filmmaker when I went to film school. Uh, and and yet they were making these films that were horrible quality. Like your first year, I know I'm off the track, but your first year film student, your first workshop you ever take, the films that came out of that, even back when I was in film school, they were vastly better than were done under the leadership of Lauren Herbert. So the reasons why, and, and this is, and I actually talk to people about this, like say, how come... None of you guys are aspiring to the to uh, to 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 the post of director. I mean, it's like, man, there's all kinds of perks. It's coveted. You'll be respected. You're doing L. Ron Hubbard's work, and what Sea Org member doesn't want to do that? I mean, that's why right. you're in the Sea Org because you want to like do his work. And the answer I got, we'll talk about it next time because it will blow your mind. Okay, <laughs> but uh, yeah, but let's let's get back to Shelley, or you can yeah. read my book because it's, it's in there. Yeah, yeah. No, I just wanted to add, just to just to return. Okay, good. So yeah, now that we've, now that we've put the mystery sandwich there for everybody. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, you have it. I sent it to you. You can just read it. Okay, fair um, enough. Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, but but in terms of Shelley, right? Um, would you? Yeah. So she was a very charming person, and yeah. and I didn't. I actually ran into her a few years after she disappeared. You did. Um, yeah, I saw her in Redlands, California. Which now, if you want to look at a map, the CST base. If you if you took a, uh, 
the road down from the CST base from Big Bear, the first place you come to of any really significant civilization. And Redlands is a really nice, charming town with a great history in Southern California. It would be Redlands. I mean, that's okay. where you would go. Yep, yep. I mean, there's there's great restaurants and shopping. So yeah, I ran into her. I I would stop there uh, on my way up to Gold uh, to have lunch, like on a Monday. Why? Right? I you know I wasn't expected up till maybe right after lunch or whatever. And I was at my regular little eating place, and there's a couple of restaurants, you know, like typical stuff: Sharky, Starbucks, you know, um, Chipotle, you know, that kind of thing. And she's at a at a at a table with a you know a patio. It's a beautiful day with you know her handlers who one of them had been my auditor uh, who I knew quite well so but the people that they talk about that she's supposedly with that's who I rented so and it was kind of awkward because I, I wasn't really thinking oh there's Shelly because I was mm. like whatever I saw people disappear all the time they go on missions sure they, they'd go away you wouldn't see them right, right? it was right. no big deal that's the c word right yeah and so I always thought oh she's off on some project because it had only been a couple of years uh, okay Okay. That she hadn't been around. So there wasn't but, some big broad announcement or anything about Shelly leaving. It was just Oh no. She no, just wasn't well, there. I, no, no, she just disappeared. And and I wouldn't, you know, I was like not privy. I didn't go to staff meetings or musters or divisional conferences or I didn't do any of that stuff. Right, right. right. Um but no, she just wasn't around from my perspective, from what I saw. She just was no longer around. I ran into her and then we sort of all made eye contact. So I had, I went up, I said, hi, there was kind of like, what you doing here? But in a kind of like not accusatory way. And I was like, oh, I just stopped for lunch. I'm heading up. I'm going, oh, cool. So oh, it's great to see you guys. And like I said, one of them, I had, had been my auditor as a right. RTC person who I had, you know, a really good relationship with, which we can talk about some other time. Um, Interesting. Interesting. So, yeah. Okay. So, but here's the deal. Okay. Yeah. Some people, they think about Shelly and they think, She's chained to a bed in a mountain compound. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is like, I've not been to that CST base, but I've done a lot of work for CST. I mean, I did all of the audio video properties for a superpower, right? Mm -hmm. So I was, you know, the the all of the stuff that involves any audio or any video that's part of the perception rundown. Right. I did all that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We can talk about that some other time because that's that's stuff's really trippy. Um <laughs> oh, yeah, so um, I'm, I've never been to that compound, but I have seen pictures of it. And I do know that it's five-star. It's a luxury resort. Wow. It's like that was built to standards so that if there was some horrible incident and, you know, people like Tom Cruise or whoever Miscavige wanted to really take care of, they could go there and live for a while. Oh, wow. So oh wow! Built, that I didn't. I've never even thought of that. That's interesting. Yeah. So it's built to that standard. Ah, uh, okay. Like, like she probably has seven hundred count thread linens that probably get changed at least once a week, if not every day. There's probably, and I'm just guessing on all this. There's probably someone doing her laundry. They probably have, uh, you know, a cordon bleu level chef, right? right? Because right. at any minute, you know, there could be an atom bomb and. And, Jesus. you know, Dave and, and, and Tom would have to go up there. That would be a trip because <laughs> Shelly's up there. Yeah, I know, but, right? I, because yeah. cause did he ever, I mean, all the years after, because this is like, what, 2004 or five, she disappears. Yeah, yeah. What, what, what was there? At, no, I guess it was seven or I guess it was after the, the wedding. What, what? Um, yeah, that's right. Was there well, ever she was any all, hint she, about she, her? But from sorry? Him, for, was, did he ever mention her at all to you? No, she just got that. canceled. She, she just was just got, canceled. In, she just yeah, boom. She's just gone. Okay. Just gone. Totally I mean, there's gone. people to it that are uh, were close to it. I wasn't. Right. Right. That, that I don't remember who that was, but who were like, oh yeah, there was a car and she drove off and that was that. Yep. And she was gone. But yeah. in terms of uh, the, her reality, just to kind of yeah try to envision her reality, um, it's a beautiful place up there. It's a, a, a luxurious set. It's built to a very high standard. Right. Um, it's you know beautifully landscaped. There's lots of hiking trails. There's snow in the winter, uh, wow. and I'm I think she lives a, a pretty good life. And for all considered, right? Yeah. Like she ain't chained. She's not chained to a bed somewhere, being like, you know, whipped. But um, 
Well, I lost my train of thought. Oh, but here, here's the thing. Yeah. She she consider this, okay? Mm-hmm. She became a metastrician when she was 12 years old. We we've all heard the story. Yep. She got was basically turned over to the ship when she was 12 and she was raised by Hubbard, right? Yep. So she's not going to leave. Oh no, leave of course to, not. No, 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 of course what? not. Yeah. Yeah, no, Hubbard's coming back. I mean, she's she's in it for the long haul. Um, of course. She, if, yeah, he believes, so, he, if he believes Hubbard's coming back, of course she would. Of course. Yeah, so of course I, she would. I, th- I think in some ways she's relieved that she doesn't have to live in that hell anymore. Right. Uh, so, you know, because it's so tough being around him that yeah, way. Yeah, I'll bet. I'll bet. So, you know, I mean, I think the whole where Shelly thing is, I think people just need to get over themselves about it because it's... <laughs> Well, it, you know, it's a, it's a, it, it has know, a lot of PR value. <laughs> yeah, but I think that PR value can, it's one of those things that can like uh, backfire on itself. I mean, look, for one yeah. thing, he's never going to, I never hear anybody say this, but it's like, he's never going to divorce her because as long as they're married, she can't testify against him in California. So, oh, Jesus, of course. <laughs> and like, nobody ever says that, but it's like, she's not going to divorce her. He's got another girlfriend. I mean, he's. You know, he's it got moved. his assistant. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like, yeah. No doubt. She probably had a lot more to do with Shelley's disappearance than anybody gives credit for. Uh, yeah, she, I think she's like the, probably. It's the the side Mabel. hustle, huh? That leaves the, leaves think, the side uh, girl. I yeah. Would, yeah, I mean, she I mean, is the only. It's, you're not, I mean, this is, this, is, this is a source of rampant conjecture. This is not original to us that Lou might be a little bit, you know, intimate with Miscavige. Um, yeah, I, 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 I've never thought otherwise. I was always like, I was always like, nah, he's doing her. Like, <laughs> if he has a sexual life at all, right. I don't know. He right. may have no. I mean, Scientology is the most oddly sex negative gr- organization uh, that I've ever had any experience with. I mean, I know yeah. there's obviously the Catholics are pretty bizarre and all that stuff. But well, it's, it's interesting, interesting because Hubbard and Miscavige both are people that I am almost 100%. Now, now, now Hubbard's personal life before the Sea Org is serial philanderer. The guy was a sex fiend and he yeah. was just nuts. Yeah. And he be- yeah. abused women. We know he beat on them. We know Hubbard was a tyrant in terms of his sexual right, proclivities right. And, and activities, right. right? But he never, we never hear one word about him ever touching his messengers or doing anything untoward on the ship. And we don't hear about Miscavige, while we hear about him brutalizing people, quite literally, just including what you just talked about on the asphalt with people out there yeah. sweating and crying. It was actually cement, but that's okay. Yeah, I mean, here's here's a guy who, you know, relishes and really gets off on, you know, just losing his mind at people and, and right. taking it out on them. And that's, that's, you know, it's all kinds of things that we could use for that. But what he doesn't do, what we don't seem to have ever, is any story of him being a sexual predator. Yeah, and I don't yeah. think I don't think Hubbard ever uh, abused any of the messengers. No, uh, that's I, that's exactly the point, right? The messengers themselves. That's just not. Janice grew not up, science. you know. The other ones grew up and said, "Yeah, no, he never touched us. It wasn't like that." Yeah, it, it is you know? oddly that. Yeah, so that that was just not any. It's, of it's their just thing. not a sex thing. It's and it's very interesting. It's an interesting point because so many other cults, and I mean a lot of them. Yeah, pretty much. Really to the focus on sex. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, Sun Moon, Moon, right? The Moonies. I mean, that was a sex cult first. Yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, even Keith Raniere, Nexium. That's a sex cult, right? Yeah. I mean, because the family, the you know, there's so many groups that were, yeah. you know, oriented around sex, and and Scientology is just kind of not one of those groups, and it's it no, stands out it's... as kind of unique in that sense. You know? It's an anti-sex group, actually. A little bit, yeah. yeah a little I mean, bit. look at well, look at look at the pain and sex bulletin. I mean, totally. Just, I want to I want to do a video about that because it's just like I'm just so <laughs> yeah, insane. It's, I know it's wild. Uh, I mean, stuff. you you and I both know that that's part of behavior control. That that's, that's right. Uh, controlling people's sexuality is just like that's right. It's a great way to ruin them. Uh, but getting back to Shelley, so yeah, yeah. yeah, she's she's raised on the ship, like she has no other reality. Maybe we right. finish this point. I'm not sure, but she has no other reality. I don't think she's going to leave uh, or wants to leave. And I I kind of, when I hear the thing like where Shelly, I'm like, 
Yeah, it's just like Miss Cabbage. You know, I hear people say, "Why doesn't he just do a video?" Like mm -hmm. one of these, you know, have her do a video. Go, hey, fuck off. I'm fine. It's not your business, Chris. It's nobody's business. He lives in a different universe. You yeah. live in this weird, yeah. you know, uh, PTS that's what I've to said. the middle class. Yeah, that's what like, I've said. It, it's right? like, fuck you. It's not your business. That's I'm not right. going to tell you shit. I don't owe you people any answers yeah, for anything. Exactly. No, that is 100% correct. Yeah. That's why he will never do it. I mean, that's if right. he if he could parade somebody like me or somebody else, you know, on in front of people like when the when the St. Pete Times did the article on him, they did a an article on him before the Truth Rundown. Yes, they did the Man Behind Scientology. Remember that? Yes, and that was yeah, late nineties, so, right? Ninety eight. Yeah. So to Tobin and his partner. I'm mm -hmm. sorry, I don't mm -hmm. remember his name. They flew out to Gold. I spent a couple hours with them, extolling Miscavige's uh, uh, great leadership qualities. Of course, before two thousand, I mean, it was I I was not all that incorrect about. But, you know, he could always parade people out when he needs to, the right. ex-wives or whatever. But he ain't going to parade Shelly out because, no. because you're demanding it. You want it. He's like, no way. Yeah. Like, no, he's, I, I am positive he is absolutely above it all and doesn't owe anybody anything. Yeah, totally. Anything. It's bull bait. Yeah. Exactly. You're just bull baiting just bull bait. Him. Yeah, but uh, nobody ever mentions the, the marriage thing that she can't testify against him. It's like, no, that, I that, that I'm really glad you said that because you're absolutely right. It yeah, never I keep even waiting occurs for somebody to me. But he just say it. No, it's great. It. So now, I, now I'm saying it. Like, yeah. No, she, she's like, mm, her lips are sealed. She can't say nothing. No, that is that is brilliant. I really wish I had thought of that. That is so it just seems so true. That just seems so spot on because why would he stick with her after he's relegated her? And we're talking about, you know, 15 years he's, ago. He's still wearing a wedding ring. He still does. Says, that's right. You can't testify. I got the ring. You yeah, can't testify. And that's so, right. That's yeah. Right. And um, I could later, some other time, we'll talk about the the, the miscavige Lou thing, but it's just, I have no doubt in my mind. Wow. That, I mean, yeah, I get it. I mean, I, I've, I mean, I never actually saw them doing it or touch or kiss or anything. But No, no, you wouldn't. But it's yeah. the way in which they spend time together. It's like, plus she's the only, she, Shelly, she didn't really reflect Miss Gavage's personality. Mm. She didn't. Like, she mm -hmm. wasn't a, a, a mean screamer. I'm sure you've heard the stories. I've never seen them, but I believe it, where she would kind of follow around trying to assuage people. Oh, yeah. I heard about that. Yeah, Absolutely. So she was more uh, humanistic in that, in that. But Lou is nothing like that. She's Lou's the only executive in Scientology that ever screamed at me. I mean, I never got screamed at. Oh, that's in 28 years. She is, the, and it, and that was on the phone. It okay. wasn't in person, but it was like ah, like I had the phone, like ah, ah, ah. wow. You know, but I mean, it was full bore. It was it was him, so. It could have been him. It was proxy, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, of course, uh, of course. And that was when I was at SMP when things really started going haywire. Okay. Uh, yeah. So okay. We, we can talk about. We'll definitely go into more deets on that in another episode. Yeah. So many things to cover, but we've bookmarked a few things here. But you yeah. have been incredibly honest and forthcoming here, and I really, really appreciate it. Um, because well, this is hopefully been really... I won't regret it later. <laughs> well, I certainly <laughs> hope not. Because yeah. this is the truth, you know, we want to get the truth of the situation yeah, out there. No, totally. and, and I, you know, and I am for one, very happy to hear confirmation and denial of certain things that I have been assuming or, you know, supposing for years. Yeah. And I'm yeah. happy to change my mind about Miscavige. You know, if the guy's a true believer, fine. Then, then that changes the analysis points a little bit as far as looking at what yeah. he's doing and why he's doing it. And, and it yeah. makes it kind of worse. But it makes it also a little bit more interesting, to be honest. It does. You know? it, it does. It's like it, it, if if you were a ma if you're going to envision a documentary about David Miscavige somewhere yeah. down the line, um, it's a much more interesting film that he really did all these things because he believed it. Exactly. Then he was just another scam artist. That's right. So, and it yeah, was easier you know, to default to that. Because of yeah, the fact yeah. of Scientology's yeah. dismal failure, you know, and it looked yeah. and, and I have yeah. thought many times the guy must just be milking it for the lifestyle that he leads, you know, because what other reason? But 
this would be, you know, a perfectly legit explanation. So I'll, I'll, I'll yeah, go with no, it. Yeah, no, I, I, that's my take on it. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just my take. Maybe uh, somebody else would want to. Well, you had years of experience with the guy, so I'll take it. Yeah, know? I did. I, I did. Yeah. And I was, I felt a lot of, there was, t uh, for a long time, he was a very important person to me that I really yeah. respected. Yeah, so, you know, that. it's not easy for me to, to unpack all of this stuff. Uh, and for a long time, he did a lot for me and, and uh, uh, treated me well. Um, and, but I, I care about too many people to not kind of, yeah. you know, help, help, you know, put in my two cents, but you know, people are complicated. You know this. Oh, I, mean, yeah. I know you know this. Yeah. Nobody's simple. Right. Um, you know, there used to be this old joke that, you know, I'm sure Hitler was nice to his dog, right? Right. So people, people, and I'm not a, a conflating Hitler with uh, with um, Miss Gavage, although, um, you know, T Tony Ortega wrote about uh, the Lenny Riefenstahl uh, connection, the Nazi propagandist. Did you ever read that? I don't. Think I did. That oh, we have to talk about that. Do you me. know who she oh. is, Lenny Riefenstahl? No, no, I don't know who that oh, is. Oh, well, it's because I went to film school. I'm trying. Sorry to be a snob, but everybody who goes to film school studies Lenny Riefenstahl. Oh, she got made, it. Yeah, she made two films. She's dead. She lived to 103. Uh, she made two films for Hitler. Uh, okay. She's a German uh, actress, dancer, singer. She's a powerhouse. She made a film called Triumph of the Will. Two films, Triumph of the Will. You've now that seen film I've heard yeah. of, absolutely. Okay, and, yeah. and another one called Olympiad about the 34 or 36 Olympics. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, so those two films are considered to be the greatest, most effective propaganda films made in the history of films. Oh, got it. So we study them. Okay. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah, so Lenny Riefenstahl, uh, her most, we're going to do a whole thing on this later. But basically, Lenny Riefenstahl had, she was trying to reboot her career after the war. Mm -hmm. She was never tried as a war criminal. She was arrested as what they call a Nazi traveler, which is a person who assisted the Nazis either out of opportunism or cowardice, right? Uh, okay. And she okay. was put in a camp for a couple of weeks. She was let go. She remained a famous kind of a celebrity for the rest of her life. She never made another film. She did some significant books on photography. I was sitting in an office at Gold in 1995. She had written like a four, 400 page autobiography. Uh, I think it came out in early 90s. Anyway, 95, I think I was reading it, 93. And um, I came across a passage which said she, ha she had a, uh, an assistant named Philip Hudsmith, who was a student at St. Hill and at the time. And Philip Hudsmith was an editor, a film editor in England, in London, and he was obsessed with remaking The Blue Light. The Blue Light was her most successful film that she starred in. It was her directorial debut. Uh, uh, one paper called it the most beautiful film of 1937, I think. Um, it was part of this genre called the mountain myth films about it, it's this relationship with the germans have with like the bavarian alps and there's a lot of uh, what do you call it the the a lot of l legends and mysticism associated with the alps and there's a, a genre of films about the daring do of mountaineers and wow. anyway lenny riefenstahl had made this amazing film i think you could find it on youtube called the blue light and she was and this guy philip hudsmith was obsessed with remaking it so he said to her look you should remake this film. I know uh, uh, Ron, L. Ron Hubbard, he was a very famous Hollywood screenwriter, which he wasn't, which I write about in my book, right. which I think you'll appreciate reading. Yeah. Uh, and he's a, 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 what does he call him? A PhD, a doctor, which he wasn't. Right. And he uh, runs an organization. He's a Scientologist and, he, and they have a million followers around the world. Wow. So, and she's, I'm, so she's re, I'm reading this in her book. My assistant, you know, Philip, comes to me and says he knows this Dr. Hubbard. And so, I, anyway, what happened was Hubbard wrote a modern version for her. He rewrote the script. And I read this in her book where she's writing about the, this brilliant man, Dr. Hubbard. So I immediately, like, I tabbed the page and I sent it up to the RTC office. And like an hour later... A, a, a you know a runner from RTC comes down and hands me like 
my book back and hands me a thick folder with the script and the correspondence between Hud Smith and Hubbard and correspondence between Lenny Riefenstahl and You're Hubbard. Wow. Yeah. So, and the Tony Ortega, apparently he had contacted the Hud Smith family and they'd given him a copy of the script, but they didn't give him any of the correspondence. But, huh. but I was given all of the correspondence and I considered that I was given it as a gift. So I kept it. So, oh, wow. Um, they didn't want no, it back I have, for the archives? Oh, no, I got, I have a copy. I mean, oh, so copies, sure they, copies of it. Got they it. just had somebody real quick. Yeah, yeah. Their ox, the whole thing. And right. Boom, you know how it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, okay, I get it. The scavenger said, it. hey, pull all the Lenny Riefenstahl stuff and send it down to Mitch. So, you know, I got a copy. Of it. I have a handwritten note. Hey, Mitch, here's the Lenny Riefenstahl data. So it's pretty amazing. I mean, and the thing is, the, the reason I wrote about this, the reason I was reading your book was because there's this thing, the best way I can describe it, it's it's the seduction of an opportunity. And I I sort of never thought of Riefenstahl as a Nazi. I thought of her as an artist who was so seduced ideologically that the idea of being handed this opportunity was uh, irresistible. Sure. And I thought, wait a minute, that's what happened to me. Mm, so, got it. So I'm reading, I'm reading this. It. The parallel has to do with how an artist would compromise for the sake of doing, you know, being handed unlimited resources and an opportunity right. to make a big change. I mean, I'm not right. Lane Riefenstahl by any stretch of the imagination, but um, so yeah, this, this, I'm, I, I, it, it's kind of part of the, you know, there, there, there was a reason why I was sitting there at gold reading the book. I mean, I'm an avid film history student always, yeah. like I'm always reading. I love the field and I love films and art in general. And so I happened to be reading her book, but then when I came across this thing, it was, pretty stunning so interesting uh yeah that is very very interesting yeah what really blew my mind was okay so in so i did this film twice called uh how to set up a session in the e-meter you've seen it it takes place in africa right yep saw all the versions uh, of it yep yeah and it's the script is full of all kinds of racist comments and stuff we can talk about that later but um he was writing that script around 1980, I think he was at W at La Quinta. Mm -hmm. And I have a, a letter from Lenny Riefenstahl to Ron. So, you know, dear Ron, so nice to hear from you after all of these years. I don't have a photo of Africa that you asked for because I've never been to that part of Africa. But if you tell me what you're looking for, I could get you one of a different part of Africa. Africa. He was looking He was looking for a photo of an authentic African village. She ended the, ends the letter by saying, you know, um, I hope we get to meet again, again someday, right? And I went, oh, I read this letter. And I went, oh, wait a minute. He was asking her for location research for mm -hmm. a tech film. Like he wrote to her, asking for a photo of an African village because he was writing a fictional story about an African village. So even after all of those years, what well, would be 20 years later, he was still had this communication with her because I, could, I, I, I was thinking, why was he asking her for a photo of an African village? And then I looked at the time and I was like, oh, he was a La Quinta writing tech films. Got so, it. Got yeah, it. Yeah. I mean, it's an interesting connection. I mean, Hubbard was, well, it's just, it's really fascinating. Like I said, Tony had written an article about it. You can look it up. He did a pretty good job, but I mean, he, I, he's whatever. I'm not going to. Yeah, yeah, I get it. I get it. That's 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 interesting. Um, okay, let's wrap up. Let's go ahead and wrap yeah, up today. let's do it. All right. Thank you very much, Mitch, for, again, for taking all this time, setting up, doing all this work uh, to, to share all this with us today. I, I'm kind of uh, flabbergasted. I got a lot to think about uh, with everything we've talked about here today. I really do. I got to I got to rethink a lot of stuff. So I will definitely be reading your manuscript and we will definitely get together again. But we'll okay, get this. Uh, yeah, but we'll get this out in the meantime. And uh, and folks out there, you let us know in the comments and whatnot where you know what your thoughts about all of this are, because there's certainly some revelations here. And I hope that it helps advance our understanding of uh, Scientology, of Miscavige, of what's going on in that picture. It certainly does uh, give me some new perspectives. And, uh, and for that, I am grateful. So with all that being said, I'll see you guys next week. Bye-bye.